IMSA WeatherTech sports car season and indeed an IMSA season after a year that has frankly been unlike anything that we've ever seen. Hello everybody and welcome along to the final race of 2020. John Hindorf and Jeremy Shaw in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Shea Adam, our VP Racing Fuel, Pitt and Paddock reporter, and we have made it to the end of the uh, excellent work by everybody concerned to get us to this point. We're here in Central Florida at the venerable venue that is, of course, the home of endurance racing in the US and the original venue for the US Grand Prix as well. Let's not forget 17 corners, three and three quarter miles around and not just corner names for us to get our heads around this weekend. This is old school. So we have got Collier Curve. We have got Gurney Bend. Uh, we've got Jean de Bian Bend. We've got Alec Ullman Strait. We've got the Le Mans Curve going on to the Ullman Strait. And with a bit of local flavour as well, Sunset Turn 17. Jeremy Shaw, this is one of the Blue Riband sports car endurance events in the world. And we're going to get it off and happening for the full 12 hours of the mobile one 12 hours of sebring yeah very cool super excited uh, great to see some fans here not as many as usual probably but still a good turnout and you know pretty good conditions coming to this race with wispy clouds around that should be you know there's, there's some cloud cover at least so if the sun isn't just baking down like it's off does here in florida you know, this time of year as Shay adam knows better than anybody anything can happen really but uh, the good news is the hurricane has moved out uh, and we should be in for uh, I think most, mostly fine weather during the day. So I'm super excited. It's a great event. It's going to be a really tough race, though, for all of these teams and drivers. Shea Adam, give us some of the storylines. Let's start in GT Daytona, the GT3 cars. As ever, super close in qualifying. Uh, what are you hearing from the paddock about this race? Uh, well, first and foremost, we should mention that Bill Oberlin is not participating in the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring this year. He did test negative for COVID-19, but he was within close proximity to someone who tested positive. So he elected to sit this one out. Filling in for him is Nick Yellily, a man who has never driven around Sebring International Raceway prior to night practice on Thursday. He did set the fifth fastest time during that night practice too, by the way, and saw the track for the first time today during the daylight in the morning warm-up session. So, Bill, we miss you, and we want to see you back at the track soon. In terms of the other storylines in GTV, though, pole position for Jan Halen and the Wright Motorsport Porsche trying to go for the championship. They come into this race second in points and are looking for a strong finish in order to try and jump ahead of that number 86 Meyer Shank Racing Acura. At IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us uh, around the world uh, on RS2 is the home of IMSA Radio and Audio. We're in sound and vision for those of you outside the US. If you're in the US, of course, it's NBCSN, Lee Diffie leading the team. Also, if you're in the US and travelling around Sirius 202 and XM217, we're on the PA at, at Sebring International Raceway and on WWOJ 99.1 FM. So there's no excuse. Uh, not to be tuned in and uh, and listening uh, to us or indeed watching us. For those international viewers, we will be sound and vision without break uh, and interruption all the way through the next 12 hours or so. At the front of the field, Acura Team Penske, their final outing and in with a real big shout of the championship on pole position and sharing pole position, the team with whom they are battling for the overall championship. Conningham and the Cadillac, ironically, they will be an a, Acura team next year and even more interesting, Renge van, Renge van der Zander, who will start this car, hasn't got a drive for next year and he could be the driver's champion. Row two, the second of the Acura team, Penske's the number six car will be started by Dan Cameron with Sebastian Bourdais is 
uh, listening uh, is uh, starting the Mustang sampling Cadillac. Mazda Motorsports, this is the last time we'll see two of their cars uh, in a race together. Harry Tinknell starts the 55 uh, in position six. People to Rani, outside chance of the championship for the Wheel and Engineering Racing Red and White number 31 Cadillac. They have to win this race to be in with a chance, but they've got a great record here on the bumps at Sebring International Raceway. Ollie Jarvis is the second of the Mazda Motorsports DPIs, the number 77 car in seventh position. Ooh, three sevens there. That might be a portent of some fortune there. And Ollie Jarvis will be teamed up with Harry Tinknell next year in the Singleton entry. The top eight made up by JDC Miller Motorsports for the number 85 Cadillac. Then it's the P2s, the GTLMs and the GTDs. Four classes, one race, 12 hours. Great flag, great start. And we are racing for the final time in IMSA in 2020. And down in the first corner, Ricky Taylor jumps out into the lead down on the inside, turning hard left and sprinting through that short shoot between turns one, two, and then into three. That looked like there might have been a little bit of a move at the start. That will be being looked at by the number 10 Cadillac as there was a bit of a, an early move there by Renga van der Zander. We'll keep an eye uh, on that. Taylor van der Zander, Cameron Borde in GT Le Mans Corvette. Leads Connor De Filippi and BMW, then Jesse Kron, then Tom Milner as the GT Le Mans cars go through. And we already have a penalty for a violation building up to rolling off on the formation lap. Shea Adam, our VP Racing Fuels, Pit and Paddock reporter, has the details. You're allowed to change away from your qualifying tires, but it has to be within a certain window and definitely not within 30 minutes before the race. Well, Magnus GRT has a drive through penalty because they changed their tires after the pre-race deadline. Oops. That will be a drive through for that. Start is under review, standard operational procedure, but there was moving out of line by Renga van der Zander. Will he get away with that? Jeremy Shaw, exactly what the doctor ordered, as uh, so long as the doctor is Dr. Penske, of course, for Ricky Taylor from Paul. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's what the, that team uh, wants to do. I mean, they already lead the championship, uh, and uh, what way, better way to defend that or go on to clinch it than winning the race. Uh, they've had the fastest car in the uh, qualifying session. Uh, they should be looking good for the race. I mean, that has been, they just had a fantastic uh, end of this season, a dismal start to it. They finished 8th, eight, 8th eight and 7th in the first three races of the season. Uh, but since then, it's been a completely different story. We uh, four of the last five races and second in the other one. So that is why Elio Castroneves and Ricky Taylor lead the points. And that is why they're re leading this race in the very, very early stages. It's a very good job that Nick Damon is not joining us on this broadcast. He's busy on the, uh, the Bahrain broadcast. <laughs> Broadcast uh, with uh, Johnny Palmer, but I'm sure he would have burst into a chorus if it's not where you start, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Um, if, if he'd heard that, here comes the uh, 44 down the pit lane. Uh, that is the Lamborghini from uh, GRT Magnus, uh, and that is for the uh, changing of tyres early on and that's going to drop that car way way back already the leaders then through turn 10 and heading to turn number 11 and then the battle in the GT Le Mans category and it's a new leader there BMW Team RLL Conor de Filippi in the red BMW Team RLL MH GTE and he's got ahead of Tony Garcia, champions elect. Uh, have they now won the championship, Jeremy, by starting this race, uh, Garcia uh, and uh, and uh, and Taylor? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, they'd, uh, they'd already clinched it. They were 35 ahead uh, coming into this race, so uh, they actually didn't even need to start because uh, they got way more wins than their sister car, Oliver Gavin and uh, Tommy Milner. So that was uh, with a 35 point lead, uh, that's how many points you get for a win. So they had actually already clinched it prior to this weekend. Uh, ditto for the number three team, the team's championship. Uh, the uh, manufacturer's championship uh, also has been clinched by Chevrolet. It's Jeremy Shaw as we've got some side by side action on the Alec Ullman straight away at the LMP2 battles going through. Uh, and that 
uh, is uh, was a, a, a wonderful run by the way again for Patrick Kelly uh, in qualifying and I think that was uh, John Ferrano going past yes it was Naveen Rao who was very impressive in his first outing uh, in the car this week stepping up to LMP2 Jeremy and qualified the Inter Europol competition number 51 very well indeed yeah uh, Naveen I mean he really did uh, he, he's improved his driving he hasn't been driving for that long uh, but uh, he's, he's just got better and better and better the last few years, being coached very, very expertly by Matt Bell. Uh, won this year's uh, Prototype Challenge Championship, very impressive. He had a couple of pole positions in there, and, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's a proper driver now. He's not just a, a, a you know, gentleman driver out there having some fun, uh, and that's reflected the fact here he is in his first you know, proper top-line race, and uh, you know, really doing a nice job as well in that uh, number, uh, number 51 team. Uh, hello to Phil, to Andy and Aylin, uh, with uh, Gotham the Cat, to Flank Plasmans in the Netherlands, and everyone else who's tuned in around the world. Sound and vision from IMSA Radio and IMSA TV. WWOJ 99.1 uh, around the environs of the circuit in Central Florida, and of course across the US on Sirius 202, XM 217, RS2 around the world without block or break. Good to have your company. It's Jeremy Shaw, who you've just heard, and me, John Heindorf, in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Our pit and paddock reporter is our VP Racing Fuels reporter, Shea Adam. Uh, and Shea, a good start by everyone concerned, particularly at the front of GT Daytona. Jan Halen out front for Wright Motorsports. What a season they've had, and they've stealthed their way in some, in some respects in the championship contention. Yes, they very much have. Sorry, John, I've just gotten a notification of a penalty that's coming through. I'll touch on that in a moment. But as far as the 16 Ride Motorsport Porsche is concerned, they've only been on the podium three times, but they had a remarkable run of races all the way from Sebring in July, where they finished in the top five in position. Their worst finish of the season comes at Sebring in July, when they finished ninth in that race. But that was also an opportunity to give Ryan Hardwick a bunch more driving time because they saw that they weren't going to come away with the possibility for a win. They have done a lot of testing with Super and Capri Motorsport, and they are very much focused on this race. Now, my loud uh, explanation there was because if you follow IMSA as a full umbrella championship, you would have paid attention in the Lamborghini Super Trofeo Series, where at Road America in the second round of the championship, a penalty was issued to Brian Sellers because he changed columns prior to the start line. That was a drive-through penalty. Well, it was, but at that point in time, it was a five-second penalty that was issued, long story short. But in any case, today, Ranger Van Der sees the green flag. He moves before the green flag and dives into the column behind Ricky Taylor. That should have been a penalty. And indeed, it has been assessed, a drive-through penalty for car number 10. This is massive. They are not only going for the four-hour win, but the overall win and the championship, and now their date has got a little bit harder. So basically pulling out of line and changing out of your start line, which would have been the outside fall for the 10 car before the start line. Green flag comes out, and it, it, you can't change your lane. Think about it as that if you were on the highway, and if you change your lane before the start line. So green flag comes out, yes, you're racing, but before the line, he drops immediately over to the left-hand side to get a little bit of the draft from Ricky Taylor and also to block off Dan Cameron from getting up the inside into turn wrong. That's a no-no, that's a drive-through. And that, if we think back to our Porsche keys to the race, no mistakes. You really can't afford to make mistakes even in these longer race. You've got to be there as we get into the darkness period. Uh, and you've got to look after the car through the traffic. We'll keep it, our eyes on those Porsche keys to the race throughout this one. Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to be critical of the, uh, of the stewards here because that is the rule, so you know, that's fair enough. But if you look, uh, if the picture we saw is a very, very, very early start by Ricky Taylor. I'm sure way earlier than he was supposed to go. Uh, and the, the whole field was strung out that stage. Everybody was pretty much nose, you know, nose to tail. So why they would just single out another take car, I'm really not quite sure. Uh, I think that's a... a, a for, for a 12-hour race to throw a penalty like that at the start, yeah, not really quite sure why they, they thought that was necessary. It wasn't as if anything dangerous happened, for goodness sake. So, um, yeah, curious one, that. But, uh, yeah, by the, by the letter of the law, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and, and I, 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 
by the spirit, I, I'm not so sure. I think the thing that they were probably looking at was the block on the the, the second row accurate, because he pulled in, into the gap between the two accuracies and blocked them off before the start line. Um, one thing we have noticed about uh, the number 10 car, which peels right-handed into the pits, and Renger van der Zander in that number 10 car, my goodness, he gets close to the right-hand side at the apex of turn 17 on the bumps. I've not seen anybody else closer there. It is very bumpy through turn 17. There are huge concrete blocks that date back to the early 1940s when this was Hendrik Field and churning uh, air crew for World War II to go and see action uh, over in uh, in Europe on the B-17 Flying Fortress uh, and the B-24 Liberators. Uh, and uh, they have settled, I think it's fair to say, down through the years, Jeremy, but they're exceedingly big, these blocks, exceedingly thick, exceedingly heavy, and those bumps down through the years, well, they, in fact, they change from year to year, don't they? Yeah, uh, and uh, you yeah, move, they do not. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, character, the character of the place is very much uh, the same as it always was, but, yeah, there's little nuances that do change uh, definitely from, from year to year. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's just something you've got to accept. You know, it's as, if, it's as if you're driving a kind of on a wet track in some ways, uh, because uh, every lap you, you, you go around here seems a little bit different. So early running then, let's give you the rundown in the classes. Uh, at the start of the race, Patrick Kelly got away in LMP2 uh, and has put a little bit of a, a lead. Say again, Jeremy? To the tune of 20 seconds. Uh, yes, uh, he's, he's, found the, uh, he's found the shortcut around. He's only doing two and a quarter miles to everybody's 3.75. I'm only kidding there. Of course, John Ferrano settles into second place in the Tower Motorsports by Starworks. And he started fourth in that class, so he's, he's got by Don Yount. Uh, and what's happened to the other car in, uh, in that category? That has, uh, that has dropped away uh, for Naveen Rao. He's dropped all the way to the back for the into Europol and has already been down the pit lane, Shea. Yeah, he made a quick trip down the pit lane. Uh, the total time was a minute and nine seconds, so that to me says a splash of fuel and new tyres. OK, um, not sure why they would want to do that early on unless there was something that they weren't happy with on the tyres on which they qualified. Uh, Renga van der Zander has rejoined, but has dropped down to ninth position after that drive through for an improper start procedure. Uh, in the uh, GT Le Mans field, we documented Conor de Philippe getting to the front shortly after the start. He's 11th overall and leads GT Le Mans for BMW Team RLL, the number 25. The red car uh, is ahead of the yellow one, which is the uh, Antonio Garcia-driven Corvette. About three quarters of a second. They've just gone through the start-finish line. Yes, Cron is third for the second of the BMWs. The white one, the number 24. Then Nick Tandy has the Stars and Stripes 911 in the final outing for the Porsche GT team in GT Le Mans in IMSA for the foreseeable future. Uh, Tommy Milner has the dark grey and yellow number four at Corvette in fifth. And Neil Jarney has the... St uh, stripes and stars 912 with the red and white stripes down the side that's the sixth position in, G in GTLM in GT Daytona Jan Heerlen now leads Andrew Davis from Team Hardpoint by 2.9 seconds that's Porsche from Audi from two Lexus so 16 Porsche 30 Audi 12 and 14 the two Lexus and they're all split by about seven or eight seconds uh, then it's the GRT Grasso Racing Lamborghini back in the championship, the number 11. Then Robbie Forley, Turner Motorsport in the M6 GT3, number 96. That's your top six. And remember, no Bill Oberlin uh, this weekend. Bill doing the honourable uh, and very honest thing. What else would you expect from Bill Power? Uh, he had been in close contact with somebody with the virus, and although he tested negative, he did not want to risk with a, a long incubation time for the virus, did not want to risk coming into the paddock, uh, and his place in that car has been taken by Nick Yellily, the BMW works driver who jetted in from the UK on Thursday evening and with a little help from the jet stream managed to get here about an hour or so earlier than he expected so he was out in night practice but only saw the Sebring International Raceway circuit
for the first time in the daylight in morning warm-up this morning. And he's yet to get in that car, of course, as Robbie qualified it. Still 11 and three quarter hours to go. The opening salvo salvos have been fired. Uh, and Jeremy Shaw, we've got Acura, Mazda, Cadillac, all at the front of the field, separated by just under six seconds for Dan Cameron, Harry Tinknell and Sebastian Bourdais. Time now to settle down and start reeling off some laps. Yeah, and uh, Ricky Taylor's just done that. He's just set the fastest lap of the race uh, uh, at a 148.683 for our race leader. The lap record, the race lap record here, by the way, is 147.472. So uh, yeah, pretty good uh, lap times uh, right off the bat here for Ricky Taylor. He's already put a couple of seconds between himself and his teammate, Dane Cameron. But number, number, number 10 car, of course, out of the way now. Uh, it's just moved past uh, Patrick Kelly, uh, into the eighth position, uh, but a full 30 seconds behind the race leader for Renga van der Zander. In LMP2, Patrick Kelly did notice he just put a lap on uh, Naveen Rao in number 51 car, so out of the pits, having made that stop, but already a lap down to Patrick Kelly, who's absolutely flying. He just set, reset his fastest lap as well at a 153.1, uh, and he's now 25 seconds clear, 26 seconds clear of John Ferrano in second place. Uh, no, other, no other real surprises. Other than uh, perhaps the uh, number four and number nine, twelve uh, GTLM cars both slipping back a bit. Tommy Milner is already a couple and a half seconds behind uh, Jesse Crone and Nick Tandy, who are already four seconds behind Conde Felipe, who's taking the lead actually from Antonio Garcia. Um, so they've sort of spread out a bit, and, and Neil Jarni is still getting used to, to the GTLM cars, so he keeps slipping back. He's about already four seconds or more behind Tommy Milner. The battle going on at uh, turn 10 as the a couple of Cadillacs formerly team cars of course but the Mustang sampling and the Whelan cars now run by different organisations Sebastian Bordier in the Mustang sampling red and white number uh, sorry dark grey number 5 and people to running in the 31 the red and white Whelan car those two cars battling over uh, fourth and fifth position at the moment ahead of them by around about uh, two seconds a little bit more uh, Harry Tinknell, and he's got uh, about four seconds to make up on Dave Cameron, who's got about a second and a half on his teammate Ricky Taylor. As traffic comes into play, one of our Porsche keys to the race in the Michelin Countdown to Green earlier on. Another one, Shea, was be there in the darkness. Uh, normally, when we talk about the darkness and, and particularly set up for the cars uh, in the darkness, we talk about the temperatures dropping here when we are in March. Uh, which is the normal time for the Mobile One 12 hours uh, of Sebring. There are still some little vagaries to set up that might make a difference, and one or two of the teams are looking already 11 and a half, or actually it won't be that, will it? About eight hours uh, down the road until the sun starts to set. That is completely true, John, and particularly in that GTLM category, as the 48 Formula Race in Lamborghini comes down the pit lane to visit me. Uh, that's going to be a four-hour related pit stop because they're racing at the four-hour mark. But in terms of racing for darkness, do not expect to see either of the Porsches or the Ford Corvette necessarily leading the way while the sun is still up. Those cars in particular have been specially set up to be good when the sun isn't shining. So right. that's when the race is won, that's when the championships are won, and that's when those cars are going to pounce. Uh, no championship aspirations uh, for the GT Le Mans Porsches because of them uh, missing uh, VIR, of course, after the problems uh, with COVID uh, spreading through the paddock uh, in Europe after after Le Mans, Jeremy. Um, but uh, this is their last race. They want to go out on a bang. They want to prove to everybody that they have still got the pace and that the Porsche standards can be can be held high. Yeah, very very true, John. Absolutely right because uh, yeah, they, they missed the race at Charlotte. Uh, uh, a few races ago, Charlotte, a couple of months sorry, ago, yes. but uh, but uh, but other than that, you know, they, they've been omnipresent in all of the uh, GTLM races since the formation of what is now the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship in 2014. This will be the 76th race, uh, and because they missed that that round, the the only drivers that, that have actually competed in in every single race in GTLM are Antonio Garcia, Oliver Gavin, and John Edwards. Each has 75 starts coming into this weekend. Incidentally, uh, over the, the, the most number of starts by anyone in this championship is Andy Lally, 
category also is the only driver to compete in every GTD race. Uh, you know, there's different numbers of GTD, GTLM, LMP2, and DPI races during the season, so that explains that discrepancy. A couple of little notes. I'm surprised number 48 car coming, coming in that soon. Uh, yeah, even if you're looking at four hours, we're only not even 20 minutes into the race, so that seems a bit odd to coming in to be coming in that early, from my perspective. Uh, uh, and also, well, particularly Jeremy on that, uh, because that all that thinking could be interrupted by a safety car after two and a half hours. That's what I'm saying. Or, or, or yeah, I mean, if he comes out, yeah, within the next uh, few, yeah, next little while, then fine, you know, it might play in their favour. But it seems to be an awful long way. Uh, ahead to be planning that, but uh, maybe they are planning on, on there being a caution within the first uh, 40 to 45 minutes or so in the race, which case that will that might play, play out in their favour. Still a slightly strange one, then I think. Uh, but also, uh, you know, I mean, four hours, you know, four hours that's uh, time, time and a half, if you like, in terms of our regular you know, <laughs> uh, championship races. It's Jeremy Shaw in the Hagany Global Broadcast Centre with me, John Hindoff. Hello to Dave Alcock uh, and Ian McCarthy. Uh, Dave Alcock noticing just how bumpy the Apex is on turn 17. Hello, Dave. Uh, they look to be bouncing even more than last year. Will the team managers be telling their drivers to stay away uh, from the inside of the corner to avoid excessive wear and tear on suspension and tyres this early uh, in the race? It's a fair point, Dave, because we have seen in some of the Challenge Series, uh, we mentioned the Lamborghini effectively getting a tyre bead pulled off the rim there uh, yesterday during the, the second of the, the Lamborghini Super Trofeo races. And in the Mission and Pilot Challenge, Shea Adam, we did have a shock absorber break close to the end of the race that took somebody out of a uh, out of a podium position that was the road shagger audi wasn't it yes it was uh, we saw a lot of white smoke coming out of the side of that car we thought it might have been a tire issue but it was the front right shock housing that snapped clean in half when was the last time you ever yeah. heard of that happening on an audi yeah absolutely Welcome to Sebring. hashtag respect the bumps even in november and you just can't take this place for granted insanely quick in places and getting quicker tire technology down through the years and michelin have done such a fantastic job since they came into the series we were talking about in the earlier broadcasts jeremy just how fast some of these corners are now and even for the gt cars you've, you've got to have a really big performance advantage to make a pass at, at turn one now because it, there's actually very little slowing down going on there super commitment left-hander at the start of the lap yeah i mean that's always been a super fast corner uh, turn one but you're right with the technology that they have nowadays it's, it's certainly a lot easier to take it flat out than it used to be in the old days when everything was perhaps even more on the edge but you know the, it's uh, it's just a great racetrack from, from that perspective there's so many such a great variety of corners here uh, and all of them uh, you have to kind of handle in different ways if you like and, you know, for the, for the uh, suspension engineers uh, then it's, it's particularly challenging here and shock absorber programs are they've always been important uh, i think the, the importance has been more recognized in recent years certainly or you know, over the last 15 20 years certainly but uh, you know that is a crucial aspect of setting these cars up for this racetrack uh, and jake wilson among a number who tweeted at us at ipsa radio and to remind us that it, it was neither Virginia or indeed Charlotte that Porsche uh, missed, although they had a nightmare race at Charlotte, finishing fifth and sixth. It was mid high high uh, that the uh, the Porsche team uh, didn't get to. Yeah, I know. I know. I had I had the picture of the circuit in my mind. I knew it was rolling countryside, uh, but I got uh, the one that they probably wished they'd missed Charlotte after the uh, the result that they they got there. Uh, we're moving into uh, just over, or just on 40, uh, 20 minutes rather, of this uh, race having been completed. Good to have your company wherever you are, are in the world. It's the IMSA Radio and IMSA TV team together for the final time uh, this season. The 68th annual Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring will go right to the end. Uh, it's a uh, little bit uh, more difficult I know for you guys to follow over in Europe what is it half past three in the afternoon in the UK just after our later in Europe lots of motorsport this weekend we know that so if you uh, have chosen to be with us we thank you very much indeed 
great action already early on. GT Daytona, Jan Halen leads for Wright Motorsports in the Porsche ahead of Team Hardpoint Audi and Andrew Davis. Then Frank Monte Calvo for the first of the Ian Vassar Sullivan Lexus Arantil. It's his teammate about four seconds further back then. It is Richard Highstand for GRT, Grasser Racing Team for the Lamborghini Huracan, the number 11, and then Robbie Foley making up the top six for Turner Motorsport. Then the Ferrari of Cooper McNeil, Shinji Mishimi for Mershank Racing with Acura. Uh, not going to be uh, in the GT Daytona ranks next year at Shea Adam Mershank Racing. They're getting uh, one of the Acura prototypes, but their car uh, has, uh, one of their cars has already been picked up by Gradient Racing, that story breaking uh, this week uh, as well, so we will still have Acura's, in fact, it might well be Acura's a go-go in GTD next year. <laughs> well, we said we were going to talk some rumours, and yes, uh, from what I'm hearing, there are going to be a lot of the Acura NSX GT3s running around in GTD for the 2021 season having that Gradient team pick up the second car, but there's no guarantee that they're actually going to run the second car yet. It might just become a parts situation. Uh, that is to be determined, but we are still gaining one, two, three, four, potentially five actors to the class, wow. even though we're losing two of them. So it's going to be a very, very different looking season, but also- Is that, is that are they going, are they sort of defecting from other manufacturers there, Shea, or are some of those going to be new entries? No, no, no. All of these are uh, manufacturer changes, okay. as far as I've heard so far. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that there is this sort of a flow that it might seem like a random situation. But when a manufacturer wins a championship, particularly in a customer-based entry, there does seem to be an influx of people buying that brand of car. It happened with Lamborghini a couple of years ago. We had one in 2018 and then five at the Rolex in 2019. So this sort of swing does happen. And for Acura, they've had two seasons in a row now where they've won the Drivers' Championship. That's a pretty good advertisement for people who want to play the same. Across the line, the GT Le Mans battle. Porsche versus Corvette. That's Nick Tandy and Tom Milner. Where will Nick Tandy be next year with uh, no Porsche GT program here in the US? And uh, ruled out by Pascal Zulinden when we spoke to him oh, many months ago now about those cars going into private hands, uh, certainly in the short to medium term but we still wait and I hear that we'll probably find something out by the end of the month about Porsche and their potential prototype project in DPI 2.0 as we've been calling it LMDH whatever it's going to be called it doesn't really matter but the next generation of prototypes Porsche very, very interested in getting back to the sharp end of the field and winning races overall, uh, both here in IMSA and across uh, in Europe and globally. And the talks that have been going on behind the scenes between major manufacturers to uh, try and strengthen that new category, very interesting. When was the last time that Porsche and Ferrari were on the same side uh, of a motorsport argument? But, you know, strange times, strange bedfellows make. And there seems to be at least some understanding between Porsche and Ferrari. And Porsche certainly wanting to get Ferrari to commit as well. And if that happened, Jeremy, I, I think that would open the floodgates for that new LM. DH with two big names like that committing to it. We've already got good manufacturers here in DPI, many of whom have, have expressed a, a great interest in the new LMDH DPI 2.0 regulations. But Porsche and Ferrari coming in, that, that would, I think, cement that new category. It certainly is a mouth-watering prospect, isn't it? No question about that. And, uh, you know, I think certainly uh, the, the WEC needs a fairly major injection of, uh, of interest because it doesn't have much at the moment so that would be great and hopefully there will be a lot of spillage over here into the uh, DPI uh, 2.0 as well as you say well of course that's the, the draw of that, that's a single global category so you can go and race at Le Mans or win the WEC and you can come and win at Sebring overall and at the Rolex Daytona and 
that multiple per team, Le Mans, etc., etc., etc. And that's got to be the right way to go in, in my mind, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, completely agree with you. Uh, and uh, you know, I think you know, there's been a lot of discussions, has there not, over the, over the course of the last year or so now, and you know, things are beginning to crystallise. And you know, I think lots of interest. We've, we've heard from quite a few different manufacturers who have expressed some level of interest. Uh, not yet any firm commitments, but uh, you know, in these times, one wouldn't expect that, I suppose. So half an hour has gone. This is how it stands. Let's give you the update uh, here at the. 68th annual Mobile 112 Hours of Sebring uh, on IMSA Radio and IMSA TV. Starting at the front of the field, Ricky Taylor leads by just on two seconds. Accurate Team Penske number seven from Dade Cameron and Accurate Team Penske number six. The white and tangerine cars then leading out. It's another three and a half seconds further back until we see Harry Tinknell crossing the line in the sole uh, red crystal number 55 Mazda he's got about two and a half seconds on Sebastian Bourdais in the dark grey number five Mustang uh, sampling racing with JDC Cadillac just uh, six tenths of a second people Durrani possibly a little bit frustrated he's dropped about eight seconds away from the leaders at the moment in the red and white number 31 wheel and Cadillac and he's got about five seconds between himself and Ollie Jarvis who makes up the top six in the uh, in the crystal white, glacier white, it's not crystal right, I was wearing the first place in 77 Mazda Motorsports, Ollie Jarvis with Harry Tinknell next year in the Singleton Mazda entry. LMP2, Patrick Kelly has disappeared up the road uh, by 45 seconds on John Ferrano, so it's PR1 number 52, that's the silver and blue Orica from Tower Motorsports, the white, yellow and black car, and Don Yount is in third position, another eight seconds. Further back. Conor de Felipe leads GT Le Mans for the faster of the GT cars in the BMW M8. That's the red uh, number 25 car. Ahead of Antonio Garcia by seven tenths of a second. Garcia is close back in again in the bright yellow number three Corvette. Uh, and he's nine seconds ahead of Jesse Kron in the black number 20 for, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Black number 24, uh, BMW Team RLL M8. He's got two seconds on Nick Tandy in the Stars and Stripe. Blue, blue and white stars down the side of the 911 Porsche. Uh, Nick Tandy then in fourth position. Six tenths of a second from Tom Milner in the dark grey and yellow number four Corvette. And then ten seconds further back, the white with red stripes down the flank. That's the 912, that's the Stripes and Stars Porsche 911 RSR. 2019 model year. Jan Heerland for Wright Motorsports in the number 16, the teal blue car, has about 10 seconds now on Team Hardpoint's Audi number 30, uh, Audi tyre service sponsored car in second. Frankie Montecalvo leads a pair of AIM Vassar Sullivan Lexus, 12 and 14. High stand still in, uh, Richard High stand still in fifth position for the Lamborghini number 11, that's the Grasser GRT team. Turner Motorsport and their BMW for Robbie Foley in sixth position. Now just a couple of seconds ahead of the Scuderia Corsa Ferrari, that's the white uh, car, the number 63, and uh, that's the WeatherTech-sponsored car. Uh, and losing a couple of Porsches is not great news for GT Le Mans next year, but Shea Adam, our VP, uh, Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter, strong rumours that Scuderia Corsa could be stepping up into GT Le Mans this year uh, with a Ferrari, and uh, that's that's not a car that they would be unfamiliar with. The force is very strong with those rumours, as a matter of fact. Uh, yes, and Cooper McNeil and Scuderia Corsa and WeatherTech Racing, as, as all three entities have proven in the past that they're not afraid to race in the professional category. They did it at Le Mans this year. And if the competition is two Corvettes, well, anybody would be intimidated by two Corvettes, but the odds are a lot better at winning some of these major races in the big category. And it's a little bit more prestigious when you can win it in the bigger categories. So I applaud that effort. And I think it really is a fantastic idea for more teams to step up and go into the GTLM category. If you can do it, why not? Cheer Adam, our VP Racing Field Pit and Paddock Reporter. Plenty more to come through. The next 12 hours, we're going to try and get a few guests for you, as usual, into the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Over half an hour gone now. And Ricky Taylor, where does his future lie with the end of accurate Team Penske 
and their DPI programme. Uh, Team Penske, as part of the, the deal for them running these cars and developing these cars for Acura in the US, Jeremy, uh, they did have the caveat that they had the cars exclusively uh, for the opening seasons of these chassis being in existence. That's come to an end now, as has the contract uh, with Acura, but great to hear that those uh, Acuras, two Acuras, will con continue in DPI next year, albeit in different hands. Yeah, very much so. Uh, it, it is exciting because you know, the cars are good, the teams are good, uh, the driver lines will be good. It, you know, be, there'll be um, it, it, excellent news for the series. We're not losing the Acuras. The bad news is, I think there's, they're both running as single car teams. I think it would be much more uh, beneficial for everybody. I'd have thought if there, were a couple, if there was at least one of them running two cars. But uh, you know, one step at a time. And you know, these are difficult times out there right now. So uh, I think it's you know, totally understandable. And uh, I applaud. Uh, Acura for making sure that their, their their cars are still going to be remaining in this championship because for sure they will be competitive. Yeah, 2021, and you know we've had this conversation many times before. Uh, I, I'm very optimistic about 2021, but I don't think we should kid ourselves, Jeremy. Um, every, the lights are not just going to switch back on again uh, when we go back uh, to racing next year. We'll follow that theme later uh, in the broadcast at IMSA Radio if you want to contribute. Uh, pit stop share, Adam, for the top four in DPI, all heading your way. Oh, this is going to be fun. All right, so first into the pit lane was the number seven for Acura Team Penske. They have the last pit box on the pit lane because they are the championship leaders, so they get the best shot back out of the pit lane. Following them in was second on the pit on the track, the number six Acura Team Penske, which has the last pit box on the pit lane for the prototypes because they are lowest placed in the championship. So they could not be more far spread apart. It was just fuel and tires for both of the Acuras. As far as the Mazda was concerned, the 55 came down the pit lane. Harry Tignall looks like he jumped out of that car. I didn't see who jumped in, but I would imagine it would be Ryan Hunter Ray getting in for this middle stint. Ranger Van is in and back down the pit lane as well for fuel and tires for the Conicman old Cadillac. And I believe he's staying aboard for a second stint is already back out and rolling. The number seven leaves the pit lane first, followed by the number six. Then the Mustang sampling Cadillac, a really good stop for Sebastian Bourdais and his crew as he stayed aboard the number five fuel and tires there as well. And it is kind of a slow stop for the number 10. But remember, the Conic Minolta Cadillac was way back on the field because of that drive through penalty for jumping to start or miss handling the start, I should say, not staying in the column. So that is still a really good amount of ground that they've made up to come into the pit lane in fifth position. And your instinct was absolutely right down there with that BP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock report. It is uh, the only driver change there was Ryan Hunter Rear getting into the number 55. Uh, JDC Miller Motorsports. Mateus Leist, he, he didn't start that car, did he, Shit, or did he? Uh, yes, he did. Right, yes, okay, did. so yeah, that is the. That. Go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, well, yes, yes, he did. Uh, and the number 10 car didn't come into the pits in fifth position, just crossed the, the, the start finish line in fifth position. He was running in eighth uh, and actually hadn't been making that much ground on the cars ahead of him. He had moved ahead of the. Uh, I think he'd only fallen behind Patrick Kelly in LMP2. But to Renga van der Zender, I was kind of surprised he didn't make up you know, some ground to close up on the, the cars at the tail end of the DPI pack, those being the uh, number uh, 77 uh, and 85 car. The gap was still around about uh, 12 seconds before he came in to make this first pit stop. It's a scheduled pit stop. Tell what else is interesting is people did already staying out for at least one, possibly two extra laps. He did have a pretty clear lap last time around. He did a 149.2. That's barely a tenth of a second slower than his fastest lap of the race. So he might be looking for track position. Remember, he got caught uh, after the start, Jeremy, in behind that number five Mustang sampling car. And uh, we thought, having dropped nearly nine, ten seconds behind the leaders, he might be getting a bit frustrated because it seemed that car had a bit more performance, but people uh, just couldn't exploit it. Uh, he is, at the moment, just coming through to the Jean de Bian Benz, and he's got lots of real estate in front of him. The next car ahead of him is the Magnus uh, 44, and that's in the middle of the Ullman straight at the moment. So whilst everyone else has just come out into traffic, those leading cars, it might just work out for the 31 car. Track position, not as important here as in other places, but it's always nice to play your own strategy and not have to worry about everybody else's, Jeremy. 
Uh, absolutely, John, and uh, and he's just turned his uh, a lap at 149.2 uh, has uh, uh, Pipo Durrani, which is within a tenth of a second. He's in his fastest lap of the race. Uh, I think you know, he, he the, the first sort of half dozen laps he realised he wasn't going to find a way past Sebastian Bourdais, so he concentrated. That's the Tarmos was kind of a spin there at uh, the exit of turn 16. Correct. Uh, but uh, I think Pipo Durrani. You know, and the team, they realised that you know, getting past Sebastian Bourdais kind of wasn't worth the, the effort slash risk. So let's just concentrate on saving as much fuel as we can, go as long as we can. If we've got some clear track, then stay out there. That's exactly what he did. He's now on to pit lane on lap 21. Shea Adam is watching. The and tires only as Pipo does not want to get out of the race car yet. He loves Sebring and he loves driving around here, so he's going to stay aboard for another stint. We also had Oliver Jarvis in the pit lane for the 77 Mazda, and he too stayed aboard for another stint after taking on fuel and tires. Uh, at the tower car, by the way, uh, the number eight car, John Ferrado, who was in second, and John Don Yan, by the way, has gone through for performance tech, but John did get that car pointing back in the right direction, so fairly harmless spin in terms of damage coming out at turn 16, but it has cost him real estate. Now, has this paid out for Whelan Engineering? There's a whole gaggle of cars coming down the front straight. Here come the Acuras, so he's going to drop in behind the two Acuras. I think he might have just jumped a position or two there uh, as he gets up to speed, staying in the car. Did Sebastian Bordier in the five get through? Oh, yes, he did. Yes, he did, so it hasn't quite worked. But I thought I think it was worth a, a roll of the dice there, Jeremy, early on, just to see if they could get the extra lap and a bit of extra pace. But I think he's dropped in back behind uh, uh, Sebastian uh, Bordet uh, again, to be honest. Yeah, that's frustrating for him, certainly. But look, you know, it's still you know, it's saving a couple of laps worth of fuel this stage of the race. That's, that's certainly... You know, a good position to be in, and that could play, pan out in their favour uh, before too long. Interesting, certainly, to see that one of the Acuras is that slowing. He's fallen behind the number five car. That's curious. That's number seven. That's the leader. He must have had a problem somewhere. That's, well, that's uh, literally just happened then. Yeah, exactly right, because uh, they came out, the two Acuras came out of the pits, pretty much nose to tail with Ricky Taylor still ahead of Dean Cameron. So, uh, something's up there in the, in the early part of this lap. Yeah. So the, uh, the six car now leads, Dave Cameron from Ricky Taylor, who's got now the number five of Sebastian Bordier, the first of the Cadillacs, right up his tailpipes. Meantime, people, Durrani caught in traffic. He's got uh, uh, Ryan Hunter rear right, right with him. He's got Ollie Jarvis not too far back as well. Oh, no, there's a problem. Problem for the number seven. This has championship implications here. The seven is dropping like a stone at the moment. There's no forward power from that uh, number seven car it's already dropped behind both of the masters this is massive massive jeremy shaw for the championship massive for this race too as the seven car i think with ricky taylor aboard will peel off into the pits this time unless they can find a quick uh, fix for that car surely he will come into the pit lane and indeed does this is huge Barely 40 minutes into the 12 hours of Sebring and Shea Adam, here's the drama starting right now. Ricky Taylor into the pit lane. Is he going to stop in his box or is he going straight behind the wall? The car language is saying he's coming into the box. Yes, indeed. They are going to do a splash of fuel before they do any other work to the car just to gain that one lap back. But the tail is coming off the car from what I can see. Uh, yes, the rear end plate will come off. They will then pull the engine cover off. Oh, this is going to be a substantial amount of work. Now, they have had issues in the past with hoses coming off the car, being bounced around Sebring International Raceway. But the engine is stopped, and this will be a lengthy pit stop. Now, Acura Team Penske has run in the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring with four cars in effect before. Twice they've DNF'd. Once they have finished in the top five, they do not have a great record here at Sebring. And maybe Sebring is biting them once again. Jeremy, massive news for the overall championship here. This is the car that was going for the big prize. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, what a uh, too early in the race as well. It, everything was, uh, was going to plan there, but clearly not here. Uh, discussing there with the pit lane steward. That's curious. Not quite sure why. That would be, but uh, there certainly doesn't seem to be any sort of urgency that does there at that number seven pit. 
So this at yeah, the moment. Some, something, I think something drive drive trade wise, perhaps they're kind of rocking the car back and forth. Is he going to go uh, behind the wall here? Share, Adam, what's going on? It's coming behind the wall, John. As a matter of fact, that's why they were talking to Johnny, not the lead pit lane official. It's driving back to the paddock at a rather good speed, actually, making its way back to the garage area. Now, I did hear a report from Acura, and thanks to Dan Layton, that all that they know so far was that there was no turbo when they came back out of the pit lane. There was no boost. Very similar situation to what they experienced in July. They're hoping a clamp has gone loose, but they don't officially know yet. So they're going to take back to the garage and look at it a little more closely. Yeah, I was going to say they'd had that problem uh, earlier on in the season. Was that here or was that somewhere where else, Shea? But they, they had, I mean, it, it was ju just literally a clamp and a hose that wasn't doing the clamping and the hosing, uh, and therefore they, they weren't getting the, the power boost that the turbocharger would normally give. That was here. Right, OK. Respect the bumps. Hashtag at IMSA Radio. Thank you to Steve Fall, to... The Andy Pothole to everybody else uh, as well. Corey G, Bayou, Stuart Hart, uh, and uh, everyone else who's tweeting in with uh, very kind words of support for the whole team at IMSA and IMSA Radio. It has been a strange year, hasn't it, for all of our series that we cover here on the Radio Show Limited network of channels. But nice to know that you've supported us through the years. And that, by the way, is very, very much appreciated, both in event. Uh, when sometimes we don't have the time, as you might imagine, to get back to you. But Jeremy, Shea and myself, and indeed all of our, our uh, uh, commentary team, always catch up the day after the races, so we might be a little bit later, but we do see everything that comes in. So thank you for your support throughout this difficult year. And uh, it is much appreciated, and it's driven all of us on in 2020. The two Mazdas then, now running fourth and fifth. People Durrani with that issue for the championship contending number seven. Acura Team Penske prototype is up into third. Bordier is second and is three and a half seconds behind Dan Cameron, who leads. It's still BMW from Corvette from DM BMW in GT Le Mans. And at Porsche from... Audi from Lexus, from Lexus, from BMW, from Lamborghini, from Ferrari, from Acura, from Aston Martin and Mercedes hanging on to the top ten for Gar Robertson. Shea Adam uh, down in the pit lane. Uh, we had a, an early pit stop uh, for the number 51 of Naveen Rao in the Europol. Uh, did we get to the bottom of that? Was that a penalty or a problem? No, no, it was fuel and tires. They took the lean route off of the qualifying tires on which he had started. And actually now he's back up to second in class, but everybody is just chasing the, um, well, the idea of Patrick Kelly because he's <laughs> so far ahead of everyone. He's got more than a minute and 40 seconds now on second place. Um, but yes, it was just to get him off those tires and put a little bit more fuel in, just going a little bit off strategy. Very strange that they didn't elect to start Naveen on new tires, but Inter Europol making their second ever race in this series. It is a coordinated effort with TR1 Matheson Motorsports and with a lot of crew guys from Era Motorsports. Oh. So a lot of LMP2 love in that paddock. Uh, and hello to Cara de Flaming, who is uh, in the pit lane working with that team, has come across from Europe for this one. And uh, Thank you for all her help, not just here, but for the whole season. Cara, an absolute legend in uh, sports car and racing paddocks around the world. Jeremy Shaw, uh, 45 minutes nearly completed and uh, pretty interesting so far. Yeah, indeed, and uh, it's uh, it's yeah, pretty strung out at the front. It's just a shame to see that uh, number seven car have a... Uh, Apparently, a fairly major problem so early in this race. People Durrani now up into uh, third position, and he can't number 31. He's managed to get, to get past the number five car and actually pull away a little bit. Uh, so, two Mazdas running, I think, pretty conservatively at this stage in the race. They're running together in the fourth and fifth positions. But Sebastian Bourdais, he's charging along there in mm. second position. He's just said his fastest lap of the race. He's now only three seconds behind the race leader, Dane Cameron. He's brought that gap down from, from five seconds after the round of pit stops. So this has a really, been a really good uh, run, a promising run, I think, for that Mustang sampling team because they've had a pretty disappointing season so far. 
at least after the beginning of the year, which started out pretty well with a trio of podium finishes. Since then, it's been rather disappointing. So good to see that car running strong here in the early stages and in second place. In LMP2, Patrick Kelly, yes, he's just romping away. Naveed Rao then on that d different strategy. He'll be into the pits, I, I think, uh, pretty shortly for his uh, second stop. Still odd to me that they would come in after, what, four or five laps or whatever it, whatever it was, uh, without there being some sort of a, a problem. I uh, don't quite understand that one. Uh, but uh, in GTD, the big surprise for me is how strung out the cars are in GTD. Jan Halen is just uh, disappearing in the in the lead there. He's, he's now got a gap of about uh, 14, 15 seconds over Andrew Davis. That's after kind of 20, what, 22 laps. So uh, he's been showing that same form that he showed in qualifying, translating into the race. We see another seven car. Uh, undergoing the major surgery there in the garage. New fastest lap of the race for Pippo Durrani in third position. Yeah, uh, 148.465. He's close within nine seconds now of second place. So that's 10, 11, 12, nearly 13 seconds away uh, from the lead. He came in at, at, at the start of the pit stop, should I say. He was just on nine seconds, just over nine seconds behind the leader. So that hasn't really worked out they give it a good go went a couple of laps uh, longer than the cars ahead of them but couldn't make up that time but what we do know is that they're getting a couple of laps better fuel mileage certainly early on it might be a little early jeremy to to start projecting forward because in the first stop of the race Traditionally, teams fairly conservative. There's been a couple of safety car laps that have been they've driven around to uh, the grid as well, and they're not going to push the envelope massively. Uh, but we have, most of the teams did uh, 19 laps, 20 laps for the uh, Mazda number 77, 21 laps for the wheel and engineering Cadillac. But it's this stint that they're on at the moment that should give us some better data for fuel mileage. Yeah, yeah true, true, true that. Uh, and the, the, the two Mazdas, by the way, just swap, swap places. Oliver Jarvis in number 77 just got past Ryan Hunter Ray in the uh, number 55 car. So it's so running fourth and fifth, but now with the 77 car, about three and a half seconds behind Pippo Durrani, who uh, clearly took advantage of that nice clear track on that last lap. So that's what is, uh, at the moment, the fastest lap of the race. It's Jeremy Shaw, who's with me, John Heindorf, in a very socially distanced manner in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Been a brilliant season and thoroughly enjoyed everything. This is the last major race weekend for IMSA, WEC, ending their championship this weekend with the eight hours of Bahrain going on at the moment into the, well, I was going to say into the darkness at the Sakir circuit, but it's actually brighter than daylight there when they turn all the lights on so much so I think that when the certainly when I used to go there the endurance racing they only used to put every third one on and it was still brighter than anywhere I'd ever see uh, the uh, European Endurance Series the SRO Championship finishing off with a thousand K of uh, Paul Ricard this weekend although that race is tomorrow and and that uh, she has put a bit of a strain uh, on uh, some of the driving uh, pairings in all of those series and so um, I, I dare say anybody who has an international license uh, has probably had a call this weekend to go and race somewhere yeah, well your phone rang didn't it yeah it did several times and the responsible yeah, adult wouldn't uh, no. wouldn't let me no wouldn't no, let me go no um, well, we've got two notable ones in this paddock. In the 31, Philippe Albuquerque is normally the endurance driver with Pippo Durrani and Felipe Nazar, but he's on WEC duty with United Autosports, so he can't be here, meaning Gabby Chavez has been drafted in for that team for this weekend. And the other one that was a really big and um, pleasant surprise, I'll say, we got Joey Hand back in IMSA, and believe me, the smile on my face is huge. She had driven a race car since last October when the Ford GT program came to a close. So we have Joey Hand in the 57 Heinrich Racing Acura, because Alvaro Parent is off racing in, what did you say, Portugal, was it? Uh, the Algarve? Uh, For um, some GT... No, he's, he's racing at Ricard. Yeah. Uh, Ricard. Paul Ricard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In France, sorry. Got yeah. my uh, my country slightly mixed up there. Um, but yes, Alvaro can't be with us this weekend oh. as... Uh, but Joey Hand, welcome back to IMSA. Uh, we've got debris out on the circuit and it's, uh, it's from...
uh, one of the P2 cars. It's the number eight tower racing by Starworks, very much home ground for Peter Barron and the Starworks team. Uh, and left front damage, there's been contact there and part of the inner arch liner is on the circuit. Not sure that will be able to stay there. In the meantime, we are keeping an eye on what's going on in the paddock and uh, what looked to be a, a turbo unit uh, from the number seven car was being replaced uh, and it was the uh, John Ferrano in the number eight car was trying to get out of the way of I think the leader of the race at turn 17 uh, in impossible hope of a full course yellow we have got some GTD and some GT Le Mans takers down the pit lane with Shea Adam we have Ryan Hardwick climbing aboard the right motorsport Porsche taking over from Jan Halen who's started the race and pretty much cleared out. That was the main pit stopper in terms of GTD. In GTLM, we've got Jesse Krohn in the 24 BMW, Tommy Milner in the Ford Corvette, and Neil Yanni in the 912 Porsche. All of those cars in. It looks like it's only a fuel and tire stop for the Corvette. Might be driver changes for the Porsche. Uh, also into the pit lane now, we've got the 12 Lexus from Ambassador Sullivan. That's Frank Montecalvo brought it in. There was a driver change there. I think it is Michael Casada taking over, but I'll have to let you know at the beam when they get out. Also, when we've got the 86, which is Meyer Shank racing actor, Shitty Machini started that car. Richard Highstand in the number 11, Grasser racing Lamborghini, and Ian James in the 23, Aston Martin for Heart of Racing. Uh, Jesse Cron back out in the 24 BMW. Tommy Milner stayed aboard the Corvette. They're back into the fray as well. Still under green flag at the moment. Coming down to the first full hour of racing completed. And Dan Cameron still leading, but Sebastian Bourdais has made the best of the traffic and his pace has been stunning. 48-8 last time uh, around Jeremy and that was his best lap of the race and he's right there with the leader. Yeah, indeed so, you know, that gap had been coming down sort of uh, you know, gradually whittling away uh, is Sebastian Bourdais on that lead for Dane Cameron. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure the uh, Dane Cameron uh, Acura team, they, they, they'd be pretty conservative right now. You know, we're still in the first hour of the race. The other cars already had a problem, so they're not going to push as hard uh, as they perhaps might have liked to. Uh, and I don't think that Dane Cameron will be terribly comfortable seeing someone like the experience uh, of Sebastian Bourdais right behind him. But this is going to be an intriguing battle. Certainly great to see this Mustang sampling car having such a good run here because it's been quite a while since we've seen that car really challenging at the front of the field. Looks from behind him, by the way, Patrick Kelly has just gone a lap down Hello. in the uh, leading LMP2 car. And while he was speaking there, Jeremy, full course yellow for that debris on the front straight. I think somebody has uh, clipped that car, that uh, piece of uh, debris, uh, and that is going to bring everybody in behind the safety car. Shear one or two got in, I think. Just before Robbie Foley, Aaron Tealitz, Andrew Davis, Nick Tandy all got in before the yellow was called. Yes, correct. And they are also on the pit lane receiving service. Fuel and tires for the 14 Lexus. I think I saw Aaron Tealitz get out of that car. Turner Motorsports celebrating a win yesterday. They did have their Turner, Turner Taco. I was going to say Turner Taco Tuesday, but of course it was Friday. Uh, a little bit of a celebration, but looking to try and get another win. We also had the Magnus Racing GRT Lamborghini in. That was John Potter who brought it in. Spencer from Kelly who took it back out. And would you like an update on the seven, by the way? I would indeed, yeah. All right. Um, it was a left side intercooler that failed. They had to change it out, and to get to it, they had to remove the left side turbo. So that was the slightly strange shaped object that we might have seen a mechanic holding uh, haphazardly. Uh, yes. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, we're coming down to the first hour of racing having been completed. Uh, we would normally do an update uh, on that first uh, hour, but as we've got the safety car being deployed, let's do it just a couple of moments early. Uh, and here's how it stands then. Dan Cameron leads. 
for Accu Team Penske. Everybody will get squished up behind the safety car now. Bordier, Mustang Sampling, number five, Cadillac in second. Wheel and Engineering, Cadillac, number 31, Pete Durani in third. Ollie Jarvis, 77, Mazda, that's the white and blue Mazda in fourth. The dark salt red crystal, 55 in fifth. Mateus Laced in sixth for JDC Miller Motorsports, Cadillac, number 85, and Ranga von der Zander still not really having recovered from that drive-through, but at least we'll get the time back now and be back on the tail end of the rest of the DPIs in the Connacht Min Min Minolta Cadillac uh, when we go back to green. In GT Le Mans, BMW Team RLL 25 from Corvette number three, from Porsche number 911. That's your top three there. LMP2, Patrick Kelly, well ahead of the game for PR1, Matheson Motorsports, but I don't think he's put a lap uh, into... Oh, you know, he might have. I'll have to check to see where they are when we shake out here, whether he's got a lap. I think he has got a lap on John Ferrano now in the Tower Motorsports car. Uh, and GT Daytona, Cooper McNeil now leads for Ferrari. Uh, uh, yet to stop, though, uh, with everyone else having stopped just uh, before the full course caution came out. That's just at the end of the first hour of racing and the first, and let's hope the first of very few interventions by the safety car with also the rapid response vehicle on the circuit to uh, recover debris from the left front wheel arch, the underpinnings of the wheel arch of the tower motorsport by Starworks car. That's how it stands. 11 hours exactly to go at Seabrook. And the next hour of racing will start now. Uh, Jeremy Shaw, that first hour, uh, winners and losers. Well, certainly the number seven car still behind the wall with Elio Castro uh, Nevis uh, underneath the car there, uh, pointing out what needs to be done. Yeah, uh, you, you, you've got to love his enthusiasm, haven't you? He, uh, I'll, I'll fix it, uh, I'll drive it, I'll do whatever it takes. Uh, that's uh, Elio's motto, great guy. Um, look, yeah, it, interesting, no, nothing uh, other than number seven car problem, nothing really unexpected, other than the fact to me how dominant the uh, the right motorsports Porsche was in GTD, just pulling away there. He's extended his lead out to 20 seconds over Andrew Davis in the best of the best of the rest, which is the team hardpoint Audi. I think uh, just about everybody in uh, GTD uh, was able to make a pit stop, other than perhaps uh, uh, two cars that haven't are the uh, number 63 Ferrari uh, of uh, Cooper McNeil, who will now lead the class. He has not made a pit stop. The only car, the other car that hasn't is Michel Goikberg, who's still uh, some way down the order, so not quite sure why he was so far back in the number 57 Audi. All of the GT and M cars were able to come in to make their pit stops just beforehand, so we'll now see all the prototypes come in as soon as the pits are opened. Just uh, a quick note for Chris Humphrey, Humphreys, who missed us talking about the number seven car. Uh, can you remind what happened? It was a left-hand side intercooler. After the first scheduled pit stop, Chris, uh, the car was reported as having uh, very little power and had to come back into the pit lane. And to get to that intercooler, they then had to take off the left-hand uh, side turbo as well. Uh, and then uh, we had, and with the reason we were under yellow, actually, do you know what? That wasn't a wheel arch liner. That was the headlight cover uh, on the tower car that uh, pinged off on the front straight uh, from the left-hand front headlight, and that's why we're under yellow. So, Chris, hopefully you're up to speed as the pit lane opens. Uh, people Durrani is staying out, but the top two, Shea Adam, are on their way to you for this VP Racing Fuel Pit Report. Hi, Dean Cameron. I guess he just wanted to finish our conversation from earlier, and that's why he's coming back down the pit lane. No, nope, no, nope. he's uh, Fuel and Tires for the number six accurate team, NT Fuel and Tires for the number five uh, Mustang Sampling Cadillac. The 85 is also into the pit lane. Mateus Lace will be getting out of that car this time, maybe? 
or is that just a drinks bottle change? I can't tell if they're being a little bit sneaky, but the number six is already away and rolling. Once again, Dane Cameron wasting no time in the pit lane. Both of the Mazdas came down. No, just the white Mazda came down. Just Oliver Jarvis in the 77. He was the starting driver of that car. The sister car has already done a driver change, but I did not see a driver change from the white Mazda as fuel and tires only for Renker Van de Zanda as well, who jumps back up third into line in the cars leaving the pits. Good stop by Wayne Taylor's boys and girls. Huge, huge burnout from the remaining Acura, which gets out in front uh, of Sebastian Bordet. Dan Cameron stayed aboard, Bordet stayed aboard. Which was the car you weren't sure whether they might have changed? Was that the Mazda? Uh Yes, and uh, Olivier Pla Olly Pla has gotten into that car. Yeah, Oli Pla has uh, got into that car. Meantime, work goes on uh, on the uh, number seven uh, Acura and up on their high stands. And I think Ricky Taylor has stayed in that car whilst that was happening. And that is bizarre. Is that Ricky's helmet? Yes, it oh. is uh, in that car. I've had that happen to me in a race car up on the hijacks whilst work was going on. In my case, it was to the right front suspension and steering arm and you sit there and I had a bit of a snooze for 20 minutes to be honest until I felt the car hit the ground again and uh, had to get myself back so Ricky has not bothered getting out of the car so he'll be taking it back when it's ready but that clearly not the work of a morning and certainly not the way that they wanted to finish off their season in terms of the championship they were battling for the championship and that is going to severely dent their championship standings the number 10 Cadillac uh, the 31 Cadillac both still in the championship hold Chair Adam has more on the Acura Team Penske number seven we shouldn't be surprised that Ricky stayed in the car during all of this. Don, you mentioned yesterday he was going to just super glue himself to the chassis coming at the end of the race. Well, maybe he did it a little bit sooner. Um, Elio has been helping shuffle parts around for the mechanics. That's why he was sitting, actually laying down underneath the car. But I got a text message from someone who would know. The, a blue-shirted man from HPD is standing near the car. His name is Steve Go. He previously worked at F in F1 at McLaren with Senna and Frost before wow. moving to Chip Ganassi Racing with Zanardi and Montoya. And the person that said, if you ever see Steve Golf around the back of a car with the hood or the tail off, you've got real problems. Ah. So Steve Goff knows his way around cars, Jeremy Shaw, is what we're yeah, seeing. Yeah, he has. Been, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's, he's, he's always in the thick of the action. You know, it's, it's, it's not significant that he's there because he's always there. Uh, whenever, whenever there's an Acura on the racetrack, he's there. It doesn't matter whether there's three or four cars, he's always there. <laughs> That's Steve. Great enthusiast, uh, super, you know, super bright guy and uh, knows these cars obviously back to front. He's worked at HBD now for quite a few years. Uh, but yeah, great, great guy. And uh, just you know, one of the most experienced guys on in the paddock. Just uh, getting news that there was a ruled, uh, a ruling Bordier in the five car in the pit box. Uh, hopefully nothing uh, attached to that car. Cabo Brink says, does Ricky get drive time credit for sitting in the car in the garage? No, that counts as pit time, Carol. So he doesn't get credited uh, with that time. Although in the pro classes, that's not going to be uh, a, a, an issue what i found out yesterday which i didn't realize and I'm, I'm not sure how i feel about this that if you get a drive through penalty uh, that doesn't count for your drive time either um which actually caught out the rebel rock racing cars yesterday they were 3.6 seconds short uh, on the drive time because uh, they took a, a penalty a drive through penalty with frank de Pew early on in the uh, pilot challenge race and they had to uh, pit the car close to the end of the race to give Frank the last couple of, of laps and I'm not sure how I feel about that and I'll tell you why I'm not saying that was that again that's the regulations if if they just got a time penalty added on then that wouldn't have affected his his drive time uh, and they could have continued to the end of the race and they would have got a, a podium at that point um, and, and I, I don't know how I feel about the penalty drive through the pits not being part of it um, and, and maybe that's a conversation that we uh, we have another time meantime the good the very good news is the seven car is back on the pit lane now does that car share coming back from behind the wall not have to go to its pit box before it rejoins 
It does not. Uh, they did do the service on the car before it um, it went back behind the wall, is what I'm trying to say. I could, I'm yes. a little confused, though, because the pit lane exit light must have been green for Ricky Taylor to rejoin the track because the last of the GTD cars was leaving as well. And that was actually Joey Hand climbing aboard the number 57 Meyer Shank Racing with Heinricher racing Acura. Um, but that could have been a potential penalty. I was sort of waiting to see the Acura turn its brake lights on, but I, I guess the pit exit was open. Car that's uh, made the best out of that. Well, Peter Tarani didn't stop. He's barely halfway through his fuel at the moment, and there in the 31 wheeling car decided to stay out. But the other car that's really benefited there, Jeremy, having not made up ground at the beginning, Renga van der Zande, the Conningham and not the Cadillac number 10, uh, was eighth before that pit stop cycle. Now will restart in fifth. Yeah, a good stop uh, by that team. They, uh fought up a couple of positions. They had actually closed up to within a second and a half of Mateus Leist during that second sit, so they had a good, a very good first stop for that number 10 car. Uh, I think uh, saving fuel there, they needed a little bit less fuel than some of the other contenders. Uh, that's why he didn't make up the ground on the racetrack, perhaps. Uh, so he got closer and then was able to get closer again before that round of pit stops. Again, because he's out there trying to save as much fuel as he possibly can, not that everybody else isn't, but he was able to leapfrog a couple of cars during that round of pit stops. Interesting, certainly, that number 31 team elected not to come into the pits. I'm sure they, uh, like Shay was alluding to earlier on, are thinking of the Michelin Endurance Cup Championship. That uh, car is uh, came into this race five points behind the number 10 car in the battle for the uh, Michelin Endurance Cup. Uh, curious, too, that the number 48 uh, Paul Miller racing Lamborghini that made a stop very, 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 very early in this race. I think lap seven, I think it was. Uh, that did not come in bef like everybody else did before this round of pit stops. So it did come in, uh, sorry, before we went yellow. So it did come in during the caution period, as did the number 63, which is the only other car that was kind of caught out by that. So all of a sudden now the 48 car is at the back of the pack. Uh, and on the same strategy as everybody else, so they, that didn't work out in their, in their favour. As we were speaking about earlier on, uh, this from D Dave, who says, I lost an intercooler on a car once, and there was an 11-hour labour charge involved. <laughs> yeah, well, well done to the Acura Team Penske guys. Uh, uh, what was that? That was, what, about five laps that they lost there, if that? Um, maybe a little bit more, actually. No, that was 11 laps that they've last lost. So let's call that un well, certainly under half an hour there that they were in the pit. So uh, far less labour charge, uh, but possibly far more burned fingers uh, from that one as it uh, came straight, uh, straight, straight in from a hot track. Looks like the, we're getting ready to go back to green. Yes, we are, because we're getting the class split split going on uh, went behind the wall at six minutes to the hour uh, not yet 22 minutes past just now 22 minutes past so there you go uh, just over 20 minutes so under a, a half an hour under 30 minutes uh, from in behind the pit wall to back out again on the track considerably under that uh, I think a little golf clap for the mechanics involved Right, well, I hope you've taken the time to uh, refill your tea cups, your coffee cups, or whatever beverage you're having at the moment. Never underestimate, by the way, in an endurance race, never underestimate the recuperative amount of a good cup of tea, which is what I started off. That was the strategy today, start off with a cup of tea before the start of the race. Uh, now we'll hopefully get another good green flag run uh, at the start uh, of the uh, race there. We ran for pretty much a a full hour before we had any intervention so let's hope we can get back into the groove and get the relative performance get our heads around the relative performance of these cars throughout the classes you tune to IMSA radio on uh, local FM WWOG 99.1 Sirius 202 XM 217 and around the world on IMSA Radio RS2 part of the Radio Show Limited network of sound uh, and vision channels uh, and we are together in sound and vision for those of you outside the US if you're listening to me in the US now uh, NBCSN with Lee Diffie heading up the coverage for you uh, over uh, uh, from 
Lee and the team up in Charlotte providing the commentary from NASCAR Productions up there. And thanks to Keith and the rest of the team from Charlotte, once again, not just for this race, but for the whole season, for making sure we can see every part of every circuit that we've been to. Single file restart with 10 hours and 46 minutes to go, and people to Ronnie leads them back to our second green flag of the 68th running of the Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring, and a very good getaway indeed by the Acura of Dan Cameron, who jumps ahead of a slightly recalcitrant number 55, Ryan Hunter, rear Mazda, and goes straight into second position. Looks like uh, Renger van der Zander has made up a position as well. Yes, he has. He's gone up from four, from fifth to fourth ahead of Sebastian, Sebastian Bordet. And also on the move at the moment, Oli Pla looks to be getting a decent run down towards turn number seven as the two Masters go side by side right behind the championship leading glossy black number 10. That could have been interesting and mixed in there as well is the lapped Team Penske car, the number seven, 11 laps down and will be charging to make time back up. Ricky Taylor immediately trying to get back up. But of course, Jeremy really now has just got to have a super clean race and hope for a bit of attrition in front of them if they're going to still be in championship contention in 10 and three quarter hours time. So... Nice. Tough to keep yourself motivated. Oh, yes, absolutely. Stages, John. Yeah, great. Uh, because, uh, you know, you're a long, long way back. You, you're really not going to catch anybody. I mean, you are, and there's going to be full course cautions, and there's certainly going to be opportunities to get laps back. But 11, yeah, that's stretching a little bit, uh, even in a 12-hour race. Uh, but, you know, so, you know, but these, these are professional drivers, so you know, they know what they've got to do. They know the task at hand. They know there's a championship at stake, so they've got to do everything they possibly can to get themselves back into contention. Yeah, and the championship uh, could be decided by a few points. So somebody dropping out and making up laps in the second half of the race could all still yet be important. Probably a good idea, Jeremy, just to remind everybody of the situation as we came into this race for the main championship. We'll get to the Michelin Endurance Cup when we get closer to the four-hour mark when the first tranche of points will be awarded but considering the season we've had we, we've still got plenty to play for in dpi yeah very much so and uh, you know it's it's interesting certainly that the uh, number 31 team should pull this strategy and stay out there during that full course caution generally speaking when you're more than halfway through a stint you'll come in if there's an opportunity to do so under yellow come in and top off with fuel uh, but uh, interesting to me certainly i think the number 31 team they feel they've got a pretty good car around here as they should of course they won here in july so they know how to win races here uh, they've got great strategies there with uh, ian watt uh, the engineers and and you know all the, the so much experience at that uh, wheel engineering action express team they know how to win races and championships and that is their combined focus here for this final race of the season because they're very much in contention now, particularly with that problem for the number seven car. Do they, ha they, they pretty much have to win the race, Jeremy, uh, the 31 car, because they were they were points down after the late rate in incident at, at, at uh, Petty Le Mans. Yeah, that, I mean, that's certainly the, you know, the, the focus coming into here is that they have to win the race and then whatever happens after that. Uh, so that uh, remains to be the case there. And they should be going, you know, they, they've got a strategy, they know what they need to do, they're just going to try and execute it. But on that, on that restart lap, by the way, number six car, Dave Cameron, has moved past Ryan Hunter Ray into second position. He will now try and track down the body, I am sure. Renga van der Zender, as you said, uh, on that restart, got himself up to be fourth ahead of Sebastian Bourdais. So all of a sudden, Sebastian Bourdais, having come into the pits in the second position, now finds himself down in fifth. It's Jeremy Shaw. He's with me, John Heinoff, at the Hagley Global Broadcast Centre. Mikkel Jensen putting the fastest lap of town motorsports by Starworks uh, racing so far. The number eight as he tries to chase down Patrick Kelly and Patrick didn't get a lap on the field and therefore of course all that advantage he built up uh, early on for PO1 Matheson Motorsports that's gone now uh, and uh, he's now going to have his hands full in the next few laps of Mikkel Jensen who's chasing him down and Mikkel's been very impressive 
uh, this week. Ryan Hardwick now aboard the leading Porsche and the leading car, in fact, in GT Daytona. Right Motorsports, uh, the number 16 car, that teal blue machine. Uh, and they still have a championship chance in GT Daytona. Uh, as well, uh, Jeremy, uh, and at the moment they're doing absolutely the right thing, leading the race in that number 16, tail blue Porsche. Yeah, and, and it's been a fantastic performance. It was a great effort yesterday in the qualifying by Jan Halen to put that car on the pole position, just did one flying lap. They, you know, they, they focused on just doing one lap. They weren't worried about trying to run the whole session. Uh, just get take that one lap down and then save the tyres for the race. Brilliant effort by Jan Halen, they're using all of his experience. And then he romped away in the early stages. As I say, he was up before, he was up by 20 seconds before that was the first full portion of the day. Uh, in, in LMP2, by the way, uh, Patrick Kelly did have a lap speed, uh, but no, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, because of the class split, Michael Jensen would have moved to the uh, end of the car for one lap by the He's ahead of him now, but still all but a lap down. Ah, I see. Uh... Right, yes, yeah, I see, I see. I, I thought that was the case when I said it earlier on, uh, just before we had that uh, intervention by the safety car, and uh, and then I've just glanced there at the timing and scoring, and what I saw actually was the gap between Mikkel Jensen uh, and Matt Bell for in the Europe uh, being just a few seconds, and in fact, new fastest lap of the LMP2 race by Mikkel Jensen, mine, he needs to, because uh, Matt Bell in the 51 in the Europol Orica is uh, only a handful of seconds, or five seconds behind, and he's just put that car's fastest lap of the race in a 52.9. In GT Le Mans, uh, we have got Conor de Philippe still leading for BMW, then it's Corvette, and then it's Earl Bamber for Porsche, uh, splitting uh, the uh, or ahead rather of the BMW team RLL. Yesi Krohn car, so that is a change from what we saw before the full course yellow. Uh, Yesi Krohn, the 24, now down to uh, fourth position. Tommy Milner in fifth for Corvette, and Neil Jani still in uh, sixth position. And at the front of the field, Pipo Durrani uh, with a full second uh, better lap last time around than Dan Cameron in the Acura team, Penske number six who, as we reported, uh, jumped uh, oh, Ryan Hunter Ray right at the very start going into turn one, but after the stripe, so nothing to look at there. There's make your way home, dear citizen. Uh, and Renge van der Zander then making the best of the start as well, up into fourth, and the top four now separated by five and a half seconds, uh, the top seven by just under nine seconds, with uh, just on 10 hours and 40 minutes to go. Audi versus Lamborghini uh, as far as the battle for second uh, in uh, GT Daytona is concerned and that's Rob Ferriol for Team Hardpoint and Steve Schotthorst for GRT Grasser Racing. They're having a good scrap after the restart. Jeremy, you were a little concerned that we'd spread out the GT Daytona's. Of course, they're all back together again after that restart. <laughs> yes, they are indeed. Uh, and the guy on the move since the restart is uh, Sean Schotthorst. He's already made up a couple of positions. He restarted in fifth. He's now up to third, uh, right behind Rob Ferriol. Uh, so uh, Ryan Hardwick uh, still leads there. Of course, we've got now you know, interesting to see who's in the car at this stage in the race. Of course, it has to be a uh, silver-rated driver who qualifies the car. We've got this driver ranking system, of course, uh, for those of you not familiar. Platinum, gold, silver and bronze. Uh, it has to be a silver or bronze driver that qualifies the uh, car oh. GTD. Battle for the lead in GTD, Jeremy, and the right car's gone wide and has lost air position, might even leave those two positions. Hard point have gone through, grass has gone through. What's happened to the Porsche? The right Porsche losing a bit of pace there. Here come the Aim Fasser Sullivan Lexus as well, still in team formation. So first down to third there from Ryan Hardwick. That's fine, but yeah, that's Ryan Hardwick, who's, who he is the, the, the bronze driver in, in that car. So you know, there's not many uh, bronze drivers out there at the moment, I don't think. Uh, so you know, he's, he, that, that's fine. You know, they, they've got to play their strategies during this race. He's the least experienced driver by a long, long way. He's picked up his pace. You know, he's done a really good job this season, but he doesn't have anything like the amount of experience 
as some of those other guys. Although, is that Rob? That's Rob Ferrell that's shown the number 30 yeah, car. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a brilliant. Great job if that by is Rob. Rob. It is, yeah. If, if that is Rob, then th I'm seriously impressed. I mean, that is, that is uh, tremendous. His confidence has just been growing uh, and growing this season. That's the hard point, Audi, that we're talking about. They were running a GT4 and a GT3 version of that car uh, this uh, this more uh, this season a big announcement from that team this morning Shea. we uh, had a, a bit of a speculate about it earlier in the week but it's now official uh, hard point making a big announcement this morning for rob furriel and the rest of the team they had already formed an alliance with earl bamber motorsport that we knew about for quite some time back and now there's an even more firm alliance with earl bamber as running in gtd next year with rob Ferriel. those two drivers paired up in a Porsche. So that's going to be an exciting uh, change of things for not only Earl, the factory Porsche driver right now in the 911 Porsche, in which he needs to get one hour minimum drive time, but also for Rob. Yeah, that's a, a really interesting move. That would suggest a move to Porsches, of course, from Audi. All part of the same group, but a little bit of an scene rivalry there. Aston Martin down the inside at turn one, trying to make up a position. Well, from Jeremy Shaw being a wee bit worried that we weren't uh, going to have the usual uh, Saturday night street fight uh, in GTD. Ryan Hardwick just keeping out of the way, doing a very good job. He's allowed Michael de Cassada to go through. Kyle Kirkwood is next. Ian James is behind the wheel of the Aston Martin Heart of Racing 23. Uh, then it'll be Shinya Mishimi and Dylan McAvan. They're all there. Meantime, into the pit lane. Here is people Durrani from the lead chair. With 10 hours and 35 minutes to go, people Durrani comes in and says, all right, boys, I'll let you have a go for a little while. And it's Gabby Chavez, the TCR champion, as he earned that right yesterday, climbing aboard the red and white Whalen Engineering prototype. Fuel, tires, Waiting on the driver change. Driver change is the slowest part of that pit stop. That wasn't a great one. Well, that's because they didn't need to pit for fuel. Even though they'd been out there uh, for a wee while, we had six laps of caution uh, in that. And so only 19 laps. And, and I reckon that car could have gone a, a wee bit further uh, than that. They did at the start of the race. So that was 20 laps, excuse me. They did 21 laps plus all the folder roll at the start of the race uh, before uh, for people. So I'm not sure, I suppose they were there or thereabouts. Maybe they felt they were going to catch traffic and that's why they decided to pit there. But that's an interesting one. And the first driver change then for Wheel and Engineering, still in with the outside chance of the championship, but really have to be on the top step of the podium. Gabby Chavez jumps from his championship winning bright red Hyundai uh, Veloster yesterday in the Michelin Pilot Challenge uh, into a bright red and white number 31 wheel and engineering racing Cadillac and Gabby Chavez then back into the fray and he has come out just ahead of the GT Le Mans battle he's going through turn 13 now got quite a good gap actually so if they were hoping to get him into clear air, they've done a very good job of that, Jeremy. They have the number 55 car also were into the pits. Did you just mention that? No, I didn't. Uh, that's, that's right, Hunter. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's coming in on the next half, of course. So neither of those two cars, number 31 or the 55, uh, stopped uh, during that uh, full course caution. So you know, they're going to get themselves kind of out of sequence with everybody else. And, uh, I think perhaps you know, perhaps they hope at least they're not going to be bottled up behind another DPI car at this stage of the race, which I'm sure was the feeling, uh, perhaps of the number 31 car at least earlier on in the proceedings. Yeah, need to get that car out and rolling as quickly as they can. Chavez is coming through the final corner now. Uh, Ryan Hunter is still in the pit lane and has not yet rejoined, so he's going to get, he doesn't start rolling now, he's just got out, it's Jonathan Bomarino is in that car, and he's got out just in front uh, of the line of GT Le Mans cars, which is headed uh, by Antonio Garcia, uh, in, in fact, headed by the leader, uh, the uh, number 25, Conor de Filippi, so that has sort of, I think, worked out for them, and there are in the same part of the circuit as the number 31. They might even have got out ahead of the Whelan car. 
They're very close together, coming down to turn number seven. Meantime, the GT Daytona battle uh, rages on with Sting Shothurst leading for Lamborghini, Jeremy. The number 11 GRT Grasser Racing Team, welcome back. Made the best of the restart, 18th position overall, has pulled out a second and a half over Rob Furriel, driving brilliantly for hard point in second. Yeah, indeed, and uh, it is indeed Rob uh, driving that car, and as you say, uh, doing a super job there in the second position still. You know, seeing Shorthorst, uh, you know, relative newcomer to North American racing, perhaps, but uh, we know how talented he is because uh, you know, they've already he's already a, a winner here. So, you know, he's out in front, Rob Field doing a, just a great job in second position, really, hang on, he's su super motivated right now. He's, he's got two fast drivers in the car with him. Well, he always has a fast driver with him, generally in Spencer Pompelli, who, of course, is already committed to doing the long-distance races with the number 44 team, because originally Team Hardport was planning only to do the Sprint Cup WeatherTech races, not the endurance event. So once that decision was made relatively late on, just a couple of months ago, uh, he had to employ a plan B in terms of drivers. So he's had, he's had various different people at the wheel of that number 30 car with him. And this weekend, uh, Pierre, Pierre Kaffer, is joining in uh, along with uh, Andrew Davis and both of those two drivers have been super fast in, in through practice and qualifying so Rob knew he had to step it up and this is exactly what he's done cool to see yeah very cool to see with uh, that car sitting in a solid second position about a second ahead of the two in Bass Sullivan Lexus Ian James right in behind them in the Aston Martin what a season it's been for them, of course, as well. Um, not able always here at the heart of racing team to call uh, on their normal uh, drivers because they got locked. One of their drivers got locked down on the literally on the other side of the world. Yes, but that hasn't stopped Alex Ribeiro from winning championships while he's been down there. Uh, the New Zealand Endurance Championship, I believe, he claimed in an Aston Martin uh, down in New Zealand. Yep, alongside. Um, his girlfriend and uh, the guy who actually sponsors part of racing, one of the nicest people that you could hope to meet in the paddock. But they have been in New Zealand since March, since the first week of March. And that has really thrown a wrench into the plan. So Ian James, who is the manager for Roman De Angelis, has been driving alongside of him all year. They've had some ups, some really good ups podiums and some downs too but it has been the sort of year that has launched them on a springboard for 2021 and they will be back and let's not forget the millions of dollars millions of dollars that they have raised for seattle children's hospital down through the years with all of their racing and fund raising exploits wonderful stuff from them and uh, as ever the racing community proving that they are part of the wider community as well heck of a heck of a battle going on for second place in that category with rob furriel uh, in the team hardpoint car uh, holding his own at the moment he's dropped about four seconds behind sting shot host in the gr team grassa lamborghini but he is absolutely holding his own at the moment, Jeremy, Michael de Casada not able for the moment at least to put a meaningful challenge into that second place Audi. No, he's not, is he? And uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, kudos there to uh, Rob Ferriel. Uh, the two uh, Lexus from A. Vassar Sullivan running right with him along with that uh, Aston Martin. So that's you know, kind of the, the kind of trade of cars we're used to in GTD. Uh, and I think we're going to see that uh, th it's going to be, it ebbs and flows much more so in GTD than, 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 than uh, let's say, DPI because of the uh, discrepancy in terms of the experience levels of the drivers. Uh, so, you know, all of a sudden we'll see somebody maybe pulling out to a big lead uh, at some stage, uh, but then later on we'll see the uh, the, 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 the playing field be, being leveled out somewhat. Viz, uh, Viz, uh, Ryan Hardwick now back in 11th place in the car number 16 that... Uh, was taken out to a dominant lead earlier on by the Paul City, Jan Halen. So, you know, we, we, don't read anything into what's happening at any particular stage of the race until we get down to the final hour. Well, last pit stop, really, isn't it, to, <laughs> to, to be honest. But we've got a lot of racing between uh, now and then. Still ten and a half hours to go. Hello, if you're just joining us. This is IMSA Radio and IMSA TV as well, for those of you who are so equipped outside the US, live, uninterrupted flag-to-flag -flag coverage on IMSA.TV 
and also on the player at radio-show.co.uk. Tweet that out for you on at IMSA Radio, which is how you get in touch with us here at the track and around Central Florida on WWOG 99.1 FM. And thanks to them for loading us their airwaves. Also Sirius 202 XM217. There has been a change. Uh, as soon as, of course, we started talking about something else, there was a change for second place in GT Daytona, and the first of the Lexus have gone through. Michael Di Casada has sneaked his way, schemed his way into second position, but Rob Furriel's not letting him get away with it as they head through turn 10 at the moment. It is the 12th car then that's up into second place from Rob Furriel and the number 30 team hardpoint Audi tyre service sponsored machine the grey, white and red car then the second of the M Vassar Sullivan Lexus Carl Kirkwood in the 14 and Ian James just sitting in there enjoying the view at the moment feeling the need to get too racy but Ian's been around the block probably more times than he would like me to remind everybody he'll not be making uh, any uh, silly manoeuvres and at the front of the field Jeremy a new fastest lap of the race indeed so in fact the last two laps today Cameron he turned at 148.55 now 148.16 so again taking advantage uh, of the uh, rare opportunity to have a clear lap uh, is Dave Cameron he's extended his lead now all of a sudden uh, to over 10 seconds over the number 10 Cadillac of Renga van der Zander. But again, that's, that's no, of no concern to the number 10 car at this stage in the race. They're going to run their, their own their own plan. Uh, the only bad news for the number 10 car, he's got number 5 right behind him at Sebastian Bourdais, who's not letting Renga van der Zander uh, have an easy run of it at all. Olivier Pla, then the best of the masters in the uh, fifth position. And the number 31 and the number 55, having made their stops, uh, of uh, some way off the back of the pack. In fact, the uh, Gabby Chavez is now 52 seconds behind the number 85 car. He's actually had lost about three or four seconds uh, compared to uh, the to, to the cars in front of him since taking over the wheel of that number 31. It's uh, Jeremy Shaw, John Eindorf. Uh, we are in our Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre, immaculately socially distanced. Uh, Shea Adam is our VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter. Uh, 31, Gabby Chavez fighting his way through traffic and following him through the number 55. They're sitting in sixth and seventh position. Jonathan Bobarito, uh, and they are about to come up to the gaggle of. In fact, they're right in the GTD battle, aren't they, for at the sharp end of the field. Rob Furriel will be the next car that they come up to. And the, uh, this is one of our Porsche keys to the race, how you deal with traffic. Seems relatively obvious seeing that, Jeremy, how do you deal with traffic? But it's about being passed as well as doing the passing, particularly when you've got a battle like you're having that GTD at the moment, where you've got two faster prototypes coming back through. Yeah, it's very much an art. You've got to, you've got to, uh, you've got to have. You really need at least at least uh, three or four eyes because you've got to look on what's going on ahead of you. And you've also got to look on behind you. Not only just who's behind you, but you know, just you, you're probably going to have in G, if you're in a GTD car, you're probably going to have another GTD car at least behind you. Plus, you've got to watch out for the prototypes and all the GTLMs moving their way through as well. So, yeah, it's uh, intense concentration required out there, and that is what. Uh, again, what makes this racetrack so demanding? It's already physically very hard on the drivers, but mentally it's tough too. Yeah, very, very tough mentally. Now, second place at the moment, Renga van der Zander has got a recovery. Ricky Taylor behind that car being behind the wall for some 20 odd minutes with an intercooler issue. And Taylor trying to fight his way actually at the moment past the third place car of uh, Sebastian Bordet. Not a battle for position on the front straight now. The dark grey and gold Mustang sampling machine coming past the LMP2 leader. Uh, and the bright red and white accurate team Penske, that car many laps, to 20 minutes behind effectively. Uh, the cars around it. 
Oli Carr follows them through. Cameron then by 12 seconds from Van der Zander. That Cadillac, Jeremy, just uh, seemingly I mean, over one lap, there or thereabouts, 48-9, the best lap for the 10 car, but a 48-1 being turned by Cameron. But uh, a full second slower at the moment than the car at the head of the field. And just doesn't seem to have the pace uh, of the Acura that it's trying to chase down. No, interesting that, isn't it? Uh, and uh, all of a sudden now, Roger van der Zender, he's got uh, that train of cars pretty much behind him. It's spread out just a little bit as they've worked their way through the traffic. But basically, number 10, 5, uh, 55 and uh, excuse me, 77 and 85 are uh, you know, almost, nose, almost nose to tail. Uh, whereas before, Roger van der Zender was able to, I think, uh, turn some faster laps. So I, wonder, I don't know... I, I didn't make a note of whether he took on fresh, uh, fresh tyres at that last stop. Dan Cameron. Uh, yes, no, I no, think number he... ten. No, number ten car. Yes. Van der Zander did. Okay, fine. That's interesting. Um, I was just wondering, perhaps, because it would have been a, a, a fairly short stint, whether they might have uh, you know, saved a, a set of tyres for, for later on. Uh, but uh, you know, he's, he's he's running exactly where he needs to be at this stage in the game. Uh, and Jeremy Singh save a set of tyres. This is, you know, pro racing, front of the field. What, you mean somebody just want to put their hand in the pocket to buy some? But it's not that simple, uh, Shea Adam, because there is a tyre allocation here for all the classes. Yes, and as a matter of fact, Ranger Van is in it took less fuel during that stop, which is what allowed them to do the tyre change quicker. And he, as a result, has come into the pits now to try and gain some more fuel because he's found himself Got running you. a little bit low. So he's now into the pit lane, as is the number seven actor Team Penske, but remember, that's one that's several laps down. This is going to be fuel tires and a driver change. That is the helmet of Ryan Briscoe climbing aboard the Conic Minolta Cadillac. So that is a driver change fuel and tires as work goes on for that car. This will be a longer stop than they did before, but they were able to gain all those positions by doing a slightly shorter fuel. Yeah. And they've already got the driver change done, by the way. They are waiting for the fuel exactly as you would uh, expect. Meantime, the Acura number seven with fuel and tyres as well. And that car gets out ahead of the number 10. That's certainly earlier than I would have anticipated for the number 10 car. That was only 16 uh, laps, that stint. Yeah, the first four, four, what, four or five laps, uh, four or five laps were under caution. Uh, so, um, four laps under caution. So, uh, certainly earlier than they would have needed to. Uh, it could be that they are, I, I, I fancy, because he had that trade of cars behind him, I fancy that he was maybe struggling a little bit and just wanted to get onto a fresh set of Michelin tyres. It'd be interesting to uh, check that one out. They have uh, managed to come out right behind the 31 wheel and Cadillac and the number 55, Jonathan Bomarino, driven now um, by some motorsports. Now, they stopped a wee bit earlier, but they are in clear air. They've got a huge gap between themselves. The seven's just in front of them, but laps down. And the next car that is in front of them, as they go through turn 10 into the Jean de Bian Benton uh, 13 14 sort of area, uh, is the number 51, Matt Bell, driven into Europol at Origa. So it's going to take them a while to catch up with him. In fact, they've got all of the LMP2s before they hit any GT traffic. So they're going to get a good couple of three laps of, of decent air whilst the leader is right in amongst it at uh, turn number uh, seven. Uh, we keep talking about the championship, Jeremy, and of course we should do. This is the end of the season. Uh, number 10, Conic and Minolta Cadillac, uh, it with a great chance uh, of the championship uh, here this weekend. Major uh, competitor was the number seven car, now many laps down. What can the number six do then to help its teammate? Anything? Is it just about being ahead of the number 10 and taking points from it, or, or is that pretty much a lost cause? Um, yeah, no, I think, yeah, we... For starters, number six uh, team uh, haven't won a race this season. They've only had one podium actually, so it's been a really, dis uh, really, you know, not what they expected coming into uh, this year. So uh, the first uh, thing for actually uh, the two podiums, last two races, in actual fact, for number uh, six car. But yeah, they want to win the race. That's that's the main thing. But the secondary certainly would be to take points away from everybody else and hope that number seven car can make up some ground. Uh, and still maintain some so hope of a championship of the championship. But it's certainly going to be a, a tall order, I think, for number 17, because uh, for Sardis, number number uh, 10 car was just two points behind them 
uh, coming into this final race. So, you know, the number seven team really needs to finish within a position of the number 10. Uh, and uh, from what we've seen now, that's going to be difficult to do. And how much further back was the 31 car in third, the wheel and engineering Cadillac? That was another uh, was nine points? seven points seven, yes. behind, uh, yeah. behind the number 10. Yeah. yeah, so nine points off the lead, seven points off the 10. That's interesting. So that could end up being the, the battle uh, by the time we get to the uh, end of the race. We're going to have to keep an eye on that. At the moment, the 31 is the better of those two championship challenging uh, Cadillacs by a couple of positions, fifth from seventh, with a lot of this race still to play out. Ten and a quarter uh, hours uh, still to uh, play out. Next to pit will be the leader, Dan Cameron, uh, the, on their 20th lap of this stint. But remember, there was a bit of yellow uh, in that. Same strategy for Oli Pla, Matthias Leist and Seb Bordier. Actually, Seb Bordier, Pla and Leist in that order. Cadillac, Mazda and Cadillac because they all pitted on the last green flag. I would think a couple of laps more for all of those, Jeremy, before we see them into the pit lane. Sorry, who was that? Uh, the top four, actually, the top four. Top four. Yeah, yeah, no, I wouldn't expect them in uh, for, for a little while yet. Uh, where are we? Um, 18, uh, th yeah, they could probably do 20 laps, probably, uh, of which we've had since, since the restart, we've had, uh, what, 15 now. So certainly, yeah, the ne next uh, couple of three laps for sure. And it's interesting to think about these pit stops because everybody coming into this race week only had a certain number of tires for all of the sessions. If you're in the prototype categories, you have 23 sets of tires. LM, GTLM, 21 sets. GTD, 18. That includes the two practice sessions, qualifying, and now into the race. So for the prototypes, you've got a fairly good buffer with 23 sets of tires. As into the pit lane comes Sebastian Bourdais and the number five Mustang sampling Cadillac. Let's see if he puts some new ones on. But from what everyone was saying up and down the pit lane, it looks like it's going to be fuel and tires for every stop for the prototype. Seb into the pits. It is fuel and tires for that car, as having just left the pit lane was Matt Bell, British Matt Bell, I should say, not American Matt Bell, but hello, <laughs> American Matt Bell. And uh, we'll wait to see if there's a driver change down at Mustang Sampling. But it will either be Loic Duval or Tristan Bodier. Yeah, so Seb Bordier then, uh, after 20 laps, heads to the pit lane. The three cars ahead were out of the pits uh, at the same time. And uh, what we've got to watch for now, then, when those cars stop, is whether Gab Gabby Chavez, where he cycles back to, because he's the leading car, he and the 55, to a certain extent, the 10 behind them, who've gone a little bit off strategy, uh, there are the next cars who will come through who have done their their stop, the stop that the guys now are doing effectively. They're the guys who went slightly off of strategy uh, when yellow flags came out, etc. So does Dan Cameron pit this time? He's in absolute splendid isolation coming through the final corner and does not call into the pit lane across the line 148 917 for that car Ryan Frisco now behind the wheel of the number 10 is at turn 7 and he's got a bit of clear air now ahead of him the 31 wheel and engineering Cadillac and the 55 Mazda they've just gone through turn 11 and Tristan Fortier out of the pit lane has dropped in behind that number 10 car. Remember the 10 car slightly hamstrung, broke ranks early on and blocked to the inside before the stripe by 20 metres maybe and that was a drive through and to a certain extent that has been negated now because of the intervention of the safety car after getting on for an hour but they, they certainly didn't look like they had the pace Jeremy even in clear air to get back up behind everybody else after no. that drive-through. No, I don't, no, I think that I think they're fine there. I don't, see, I don't see any concerns there for number ten car. I mean, just yeah, you know, there was no point in overextending themselves in the early stages. Yes, they were a fair way behind, uh, and uh, probably didn't gain as much ground as perhaps we thought. But look, you know, they, they know everybody in that Wayne Taylor Racing, uh, Conic and Minolta team knows uh, how important it is 
to, to plan forward all the way through this 12-hour race. So they wouldn't have been concerned by that. Just uh, you know, take the lumps and get, uh, get on with it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think everything is running now uh, okay. pretty much according to plan. Yeah, and they're also in contention, Jeremy, of course, for the Michelin, uh, Michelin Endurance Cup, where we'll be awarding uh, the points at 4, 8 and 12 hours as the leader comes in. Uh, and that is Dan Cameron uh, at the end of his 22nd lap on this stint, although, as we said, started off under yellow with the safety car out. Shea Adam, our VP Racing Pit and Paddock reporter, is watching. The door is open, Dane Cameron is getting out, and Juan Pablo Montoya is climbing aboard the number six Acura Team 20 for what will be, well, the last time at the end of this race that these two championship winners will share a race car, at least under the Penske banner. Also under the pit lane, we had Neil Yanni in the number 912 Porsche. Johnny will be staying in the pit lane. It's Larry taking the car back out. Lawrence Vantor aboard that one. So we have Vantor and Amber on track at the same time right now. Oh, boy. The pit stop was almost perfect for the Acura boys. Fuel probe came out and the car went spinning the tires back down the pit. Yeah, pretty decent stop there for Acura team Penske. We'll miss having the Penske guys in the pit lane. I have a suspicion that they won't be gone for too long. New regulations, new manufacturers, new cars coming in in a year or so. And you don't keep a team like Penske out with top class racing for too long. Roger Penske has been a bit of a miss this year, of course. Jeremy, haven't seen him so much uh, at the IMSA events or indeed on the box for quite a few of the Penske racing events because uh, he's got his hands full in business. Yeah, he's been a bit busy this year, hasn't the RP, with, uh, with the uh, takeover at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, of course, and uh, you know, that's kept him uh, super busy, as if he wasn't busy already. Uh, but, uh, you know... We certainly miss uh, seeing him around the paddock, no question about it, but uh, he's going to be doing a lot of good, I think, for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, so uh, yeah, wish him very, very well with that. We saw that pit stop for the race leader, uh, car number six. The number 85 car, Mateus Slater, also brought that car into the pits. That was the last of the cars in this sequence to make its stop. Uh, Scott Andrews took over the wheel of that car now for the first time in an Ipswich World Tech Sports Car Championship race, a 30-year-old Australian, uh, based these days uh, in Miami. Uh, started off his career in Formula 4. If you're not familiar with Scott Andrews, and you might well not be, uh, he started off his career in karts in the state of Australia to Formula Fords, raced Col Commodores down there in actual fact, before moving to the States in 2015. He won the Formula 1600, used to be Formula Ford, championship in 2015 with seven wins since then he's been playing straight all sorts of different things primarily in lmp3 cars both on this side of the pond where he won a couple of races this season and in europe he's, he's thrilled to bits to get this opportunity he's a one, one of only two silver rated drivers in dpi this weekend the other coincidentally being his teammate in that number 85 car stephen simpson uh, those two sharing with the gold-rated Matthias Lace, who just handed over that car to Scott Andrews. Andrews then out. Montoya, as Jeremy mentioned, in the six. Take the uh, rest when you can get it. The Corvette mechanics know very well that uh, this is going to be a very, very long day. Coming down to the end of the second hour in eight minutes' time, we'll do the update for you then. Uh, reminder that you're listening to IMSA Radio, possibly watching IMSA TV as well if you're outside the US. Uh, around the circuit on WWOJ's 99.1 FM, Sirius 202, XM217 if you're on the move. Uh, around the world on RS2, the home of IMSA Radio. No blocks, no brakes on that audio. And particular thanks to... Uh, Kerry and to Hugh, who's taken over about an hour ago in our London control room, making sure we're speaking to the world. Jeremy, am I right in thinking that when Montoya came out, he did not lose the lead? So Chavez didn't get back around. He got up in the second, Bomarino in the third, and therefore Briscoe in the fourth, though the 31, the 55, the 10. Am I just waiting for my timing to catch up? As Mont I reckon Montoya's still in the lead, is that right? I, I think he is, yes, absolutely right. Uh, he, he had a pretty handy lead coming into the pits uh, over 
before the round of pit stops started, it was actually the number 10 car that was in second place, about uh, 12 or 13 seconds behind the number six. Uh, and behind the number 10 was number 577A5, and then 31, which, of course, had stopped uh, much earlier on. Uh, as you suggested, it, it had been leading before all of that because it did not stop during the caution period. But now, the number six car leads by only four seconds uh, over the number 31, but number 55 car uh, has moved up uh, pretty well during that round of pit stops, now right behind uh, Gabby Chavez in, in third position, and Ryan Briscoe not far back in fourth, just ahead Olivier, of Olivier Pla. So quite a bit of a shuffle around during that round of pit stops, and the loser out of all of that was number five, that has uh, dropped all the way back now to the sixth position, only a few seconds ahead of the number 85. So two JDC cars, that was just with Vautier driving, having taken over from his countryman, Sebastian Bourdais, in car number five, is in the sixth position. Yeah, it's been interesting to watch, Jeremy, the 31 Cadillac and Gabby Chavez and Jonathan Bomarino. They did their pit stop just a lap apart. Chavez came uh, in the lap before the Mazda did. And those two guys have barely been a second apart as they've worked their way back through some traffic. But for the best part of the time, they've had quite a good run through the traffic. They haven't hit any of these big clumps of cars. They were a little slowed up by coming through the GTD lead, but they've done very well, and they've had some very consistent lapping. Uh, not quite got right on terms, as you say, with the, the six uh, Acura. And in fact, at the moment, they've got two GT Le Mans cars, Conor de Felipe, the leader, and Antonio Garcia in second place between them. But I think they'll think that's a that's a, a net a net gain for them uh, since they stopped some what, 16 and 15 laps ago. That means, of course, they're not that far away from another stop. Maybe five five laps, what eight ten minutes uh, or so away. But th that's that's quite interesting for them. They're going to stop, I reckon, just after the hour, which is going to work nicely for them uh, as they go through the race. Indeed, and I'm sure focusing on that on that four-hour mark in the race, we're now, what, an hour and... Are you kidding me? Have we really had an hour and 54 minutes of this race? Yes. Have we? Holy moly. Oh, yes. That went by quickly, didn't it? Uh, so we're almost halfway, halfway there. And still, first track, not very many points. It's only five, four, three, and two. And everybody else can move behind that in the mission engine. Hour mark, and also those same points will be awarded at the uh, eight hour mark, and of course, at the end of the race. It's Jeremy Shaw in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Center. Uh, coming up next, I reckon, and possibly even before our hourly update in about four minutes' time, or oh, maybe not actually, a uh, couple or three laps' time before we see the GT Le Mans cars come in, share Adam down. Uh, he, as our VP Fuel, Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter. Uh, that, that's been a pretty clean run for Felipe Garcia and Earl Bamba there. Uh, started, obviously came out after the, or during the safety car and have done 22 green flag laps. They should be, I reckon, the next leaders into the pits. Yes, them and uh, Jesse Krohn and Tommy Milner have been out on track both for an hour and two minutes at this point. So they owe us a pick stop as well. So we should see the majority of the GTLM class come into the pit lane, all except the 912 portion. Of course, Lawrence Vantor having just made that pit stop. But by my remembering that, the pace at which Lawrence Vantor is running, he should come back out on the track, or excuse me, the rest of the field should come back out near him which makes me a little bit nervous because when Lawrence Van <laughs> and Earl Bamber are out on track together, usually one of them ends up upside down. Yes, before, if you don't know that story, before Lawrence Van went to Porsche, he was racing for Audi in the Macau GT race and actually won a race battling with uh, Earl Bamber, who was to become his teammate and very successfully of their campaign in the last couple of seasons here in IMSA. And he won a race on his roof. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. It is one way to do it, Jeremy, <laughs> in the background. Not the prescribed way, I, I, I think. No, not, not exactly conventional, that's for sure. <laughs> Very good. Very uh, good. Quick, quick note here, uh, 
Well, Pablo Matoy uh, extending his lead now, now over seven and a half seconds, or almost seven and a half seconds over Gabby Chavez, who's still been pressured by uh, Johnson Bomarito. Behind them, however, Olivier Pla has found a way past on that last lap, Ryan Briscoe, in number 10. So moved the 77 car up to fourth place at the extent of the uh, number 10. And then there's a you know, pretty short gap back to Tristan Vautier, who's kind of matching their pace. And Scott Andrews, for his first run in a DPI car, hanging on nicely in the seventh position. Uh, Simon Trummer still leads in LMP2. He made a pit stop you know, about 10 laps ago now. Uh, and he leads in LMP2 by about a minute and a half over Matt Bell in the number 51 into Europol car. Uh, David Heinemeyer Hansen is only uh, four seconds or so behind Matt Bell in the number eight. So the uh, three cars in uh, LMP2 are effectively on the same lap as each other now. Yeah, very good. Uh, let's go through the other classes then. Uh, start with GT Daytona, Steen Schottholst uh, still leads uh, the Porsche uh, Excuse me, Sting Shot Hus still leads in the GRT Lamborghini, the number 11. From the number 12, Michael D. Casada. 20 seconds now, a little over that actually. Uh, that distance is uh, extended between the Lamborghini and the two Lexus, which are tied together with about a second's long uh, length of uh, bungee cord. Michael D. Casada and Kyle Kirkwood. Ian James sits in behind in fourth position. Uh, and he's right there as well, just a third of a second. He's actually having a decent battle with the uh, two in Vassar Sullivan cars, the 23, Aston Martin in fourth, Shinji Mishimi in fifth for Mayor Shank Racing's Acura number 86. That's the one with the pink and black. Uh, Madison Snow for Paul Miller Racing in the top six at six, the 48 car for that weird strategy earlier on. Uh, and then it's uh, Gar Robinson for Riley in the Mercedes, Rob Furriol. Team Hardpoint and the 96 Dylan McEvan with uh, Turner Motorsport and Heinrich with Joy Hand in 10th position. Ryan Hardwick, who started uh, this run uh, leading, has dropped down to 11th position. Uh, but that is to be expected. Ryan is nowhere near uh, as uh, experienced a driver as those names that I've mentioned ahead of him. GT Le Mans, Conor de Felipe still leads by a second and a half. That's 25 BMW from three Corvette. That's the yellow Corvette, uh, the red BMW leading. Then the stars and stripes, Earl Bamba with the blue and white stars on the side of the 911 Porsche. Then Jesse Krohn in the black BMW, the number 24. Then it's Tom Milner in the dark grey and yellow number four Corvette and Lawrence Vantor in the stripes along the side of the 912. And at the head of the field, Juan Montoya leads did not give up the lead, that number six car, in this pit stop cycle. That is significant. We look for those kind of things as clues to what will happen later on. Six seconds the gap back to J Gabby Chavez. He'll be in for his third pit stop shortly, as will Jonathan Bomarito in the Mazda number 55, who's less than a second behind in third place and less than half a second behind in fourth. Oli Klein, the white 77 Mazda. Then there's three seconds back to Ryan Briscoe in the glossy black Cunningham and Alta Cadillac with the blue on the rear fin and the top six made up by Tristan Vautier for Mustang Sampling in the dark grey at number five. That's how it stands with just under 10 hours to go and the next hour of racing for the 68th annual Volvo 112 Hours of Savory starts right now. So stand by for some pit stop action. Uh, before we get into that, go to share. Here's Jeremy Shaw in the Hagney Global Broadcast Centre. Under, under 10 hours to go. Yeah, uh, and uh, so less than uh, Petit Le Mans uh, to go. Um, and the number 31 car they're running in, that second position still, as you say, John, expect you a pit stop for that, that car uh, within the next lap or two. Uh, and right behind him, both of the Mazas now. Yeah, Olivier Class certainly made some ground there. He's closed in on both of those two. So we've got that three-car battle, effectively, for a second position. Uh, Ryan Briscoe's not far back behind them. Tristan Vautier neither in the next car. So it's game on very much in in DPI. Uh, in uh, LMP2, David Heinemeyer Hansen actually closed the gap quite substantially there to Matt Bell. He's only a second behind him now. Remember last time I talked, which was only what? Two or, two or three laps ago, it was four seconds back. So good job once again by the Dane. In GTD,
Einstein, short horse, it's his turn uh, to ha have a, a commanded lead now. In the first part of the race, he's got the 16 car, as you're explaining. He's now got a big lead, but pretty much everybody else are within probably 10 seconds of, of each other, or maybe 15, all the way down the field. Ryan Hardwick is having a pretty good battle in there with uh, Cooper McNeil, Spencer Pompelli, and he's right behind Joey Hand as well, so he's in really good company. Uh, even though they're, they're towards the, you know, the, the, the tail end of the field, they are at the back of the field. It's very much still content. Thanks, Jeremy. And GT Le Mans pit stop starting. Cher Adam has this VP Racing Field Pit report. Connor Di Filippi into the pit lane in the red BMW, which is the number 25, winner of the six hours at Road Atlanta earlier this year. And that would be Colton Herta taking over from Connor, so one C to another. For young American drivers, slight bit of issue with the driver change, but they managed to get the car door shut after it drops off the air jacks. And still waiting on the fuel there when in the next pit box up with the number 24 BMW. When Jesse Crone brings that one in, it will be Augusto Farkas taking over there. Nice and smooth, nicely done. It should be that the determining factor for the pit stop is how long the fuel is going in. Now here in IMSA, you can fuel, tyre and change drivers all at the same time. And what should take the longest out of all of that, you might think changing the driver would take the longest time. These guys practice and practice and practice. If it was me getting in or out, then yes, it would take them about a week particularly to get me out of the car because I would be fighting them off quite frankly uh, but it is the fuel that takes the longest time and so when you see nothing happening just check to see if the fuel hose is still on if it is they aren't losing time if the fuel man has stepped back and they're still putting a tire and a wheel on or they are still trying to bolt somebody into the car then it is indeed losing them time uh, we've just had Lexus in as well from GTD, Cher. That was the number 12 Lexus that came in, Michael De Casada behind the wheel. And taking over was Townsend Bell. Fuel and four new tires on that car, also into the pit lane, was Jonathan Bomarito, meaning that the 55 Mazda has now cycled through all three of its drivers, fuel and tires there. And in the 31 Whalen Engineering Cadillac, that is Gabby Chavez staying aboard, fuel and tires for that car as well. And that, Jeremy, pretty much spot on time for all of those guys. We're keeping an eye to make sure they're getting the, the mileage that we would expect from them. That was 22 laps for Chavez, 21 for Jonathan Bomarito. So, and they pitted a, a lap apart. Uh, so Bomarito actually might have thought he would have got a, an extra lap I'll, I'll come back to you in a second jeremy as we've got more gt le mans runners in and this is all significant at this stage particularly for the driver Shea adam who's just jumped aboard uh, corvette number four that would be oliver gavin getting behind the wheel nine hours and 55 minutes to go in this race is, as uh, jeremy rightly said less than a petite so he's taking his first opportunity to drive the C8R around Sebring in November, in the 12 hours. I was going to say in the 12 hours, but then we'll see you add in that November part. It just messes with your brain a little bit. All normal for that pit stop down in Corvette Racing. And Augusto Farfus did take over the black BMW. Into the pit lane comes the sister Lexus. That is the number 14. And that is Kyle Kirkwood staying aboard. So no driver change for the 14, unlike the sister car where there was a driver change. Oh, and also into the pit lane, John Potter uh, is now out. Uh, Spencer Pompelli did a stint in the 44 Magnus GRT Lamborghini, and Richard Highstand is back into the number 11 for GRT in their Lamborghini. So those are two significant driver changes. Wright Motorsports bringing Ryan Hardwick into the pits. He complained that the car was feeling a little bit loose in his trail back from first to 11th place in the GTD class. They're just waiting on fuel, and I didn't see a driver change there, but I could have missed it. Uh, all going to plan so far. Phil Horse comes out at the right motorsport number 16. Uh, and just before I let you uh, settle back, share and watch what's going on as in comes the 911, Earl Bamba, who needs an hour in that car, doesn't he? I, I'll cycle back and I'll ask, and I'll, I'll tell you why I've asked that in a moment. Needs an hour in that car for drive time, doesn't he? 
Yes, correct. And he has been in that car for just over an hour, so he would be okay to exit it, but he is staying aboard. They're actually tightening a clamp around one of the hoses that gives the driver a little bit more air blowing through the car, so a little bit more comfort. But Earl is staying aboard, so he is going to do a double stint in the 911 before he jumps into the 912 for the first time. So this does mean we get another opportunity for Earl versus Larry. Yeah, and that, that's important to note, Shea, because He's listed in the 912 as well, which is his usual car. Uh, the massive congestion of fixtures and races means that they haven't got the choice uh, of getting Mathieu Jaminier and one or two of the other endurance drivers over. But the four hours in any six that a driver can spend out on the track, that is not car specific, that's driver specific. So he couldn't do two and a half hours in one car and do two and a half hours in the other. No, correct. And he will have done two hours in the 911, which means that he could either do a short single stint in the 912 or that Neil Yanni will need to be the next car, uh, excuse me, Neil Johnny will need to be the next driver in the 912 again to give Earl Bamber a slightly elongated window so that he doesn't cross over that four hours in any six fresh. Yeah, we have to keep an, keep an eye on all of that. Uh, and, as, and as far sheer as the, um, the drive times in the AM classes are concerned? Uh, we have three hours, nice and simple. Right. Try to keep it playing forward for us. Three hours for any silver or bronze driver, every silver and bronze driver. The and Alex two classes. Come on, it's a bit late. Our team is getting in the grand studio. Yes, it's enough to uh, just losing Shea there for a moment, but it is the GT Le Mans uh, leader, and that will be full service, Jeremy, for that car. Driver change going on as well. Still got the uh, hose in for the fuel. Everything else is done. Just cleaning out the uh, areas that do the cooling. And Shea, driver change there? Yes, Jordan Taylor took over. Excellent. This, we're getting into a nice plan there. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say, we're getting into a nice rhythm now, Jeremy, just as you and I like. And, and, and I'm, I'm watching how this is starting uh, to play out. And the, the tiles across one of my screens, um, and I still think it'd be a great idea to do those as a, as a sort of splashback somewhere, beginning to grow out to the right-hand side now. So this is all beginning to get into the rhythm of the race. And, and that's for us, that's for the teams as well, and particularly for the engineers. They're gathering data all the time. Track temperature just under 30 Celsius, air temperature round about the same, humidity well, up in the 70s. Still no real wind to talk about, but they'll be keeping an eye on everything so that if they have to make any small adjustments like air pressure adjustments in the tyres or anything like that, they'll be well ahead of that. The problem is, you're always working a little bit behind the curve, aren't you? Because the tyres that come off, you've already had to put a set of tyres on. So if you're going to make any major adjustments, you've got to do that sort of two stops down the line. Uh, yeah, true. You, 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 there's a lot of thought that has to go into these races. Isn't it? We, oh, yeah. we talk about strategy being so important. And you know, you're absolutely right there, John. It is. And you know, what you put on when, you know, sometimes you, 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 you might even use a, 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 a set of tyres that has been you know, lightly used earlier on or even during the practice sessions or whatever it might be and you know, there's so many different permutations that the teams and, and strategies have to work through yeah, Ian McCarthy tweeting at IMSA Radio thank you Ian, it's just striking how often and for how long three or four classes of car are together on the track Sebring probably not a circuit where you want to get too adventurous with your lines don't uh, disagree with you that we call that um, that phenomenon clumping uh, is what we call. it's a technical term it is a technical term yeah. uh, and we were talking in uh, another program the other day actually there has to be it has to be worthwhile somebody writing a thesis about that Jeremy never mind these people who do traffic management for the the highways where you know somebody breaks a bit hard in Sheffield uh, and somebody in Newcastle has to come to a, a, a direct stop because of the ripple effect and all of that. We want to know what the algorithm, what the mathematical progression is 
behind this clumping because it doesn't matter whether we've got three and three quarter miles and 30 odd cars here at Sebring, whether we've got 170 cars around the Nürburgring Nordschleife, 60 cars around eight and a half miles of uh, Le Mans, it does seem to happen when you and when you think about the fact that all these cars are making their lap times in different ways and the classes yeah. are all very carefully controlled as to how they fit together. It really shouldn't happen, but it always does. Yeah, no, it's just magnetism, John. Eh? That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> The cars are naturally drawn to one another. The hope, the hope is they don't get too close to one another. Uh, indeed so. Indeed so. Uh, over two and a quarter hours then, on two and a half hours, uh, completed. Uh, Sebring, look at an absolute picture. A little bit of fluffy cloud in the sky, but plenty of blue out there. As uh, Gabby Chavez goes through turn uh, number seven at the hairpin and goes past the tower racing car uh, actually that isn't the tower racing car at all is it that's the 38 the performance tech motorsport number 38 my apologies uh, so they head up to turn 13 and head on to the part of the circuit furthest away from the pit lane strange to see and thank you again by the way to nascar productions for giving us access to pictures so we can see all the way around the circuit strange to see so few people on the infield from the uh, overhead shots a bit of argy and if you will bargy going down to turn seven and that was Sir brian sellers and matt mcmurray squabbling over eighth and ninth position jeremy and gtd with uh, ryan briscoe coming uh, no not with ryan briscoe with tristan fortier coming through that battle i think there might have been a little trading of paint there yeah, it looked a little bit tight, didn't it, as it came down towards the hairpin at uh, turn seven. Not a lot of room between those cars as well. And, uh, yeah, the cars do move around a lot over the bumps there, so uh, maybe we'll give them uh, uh, that that as the explanation as to why they got a bit close, because there's certainly no, no point in uh, banging, banging doors with uh, nine hours and 45 minutes and 15 seconds remaining in the race. It's Jeremy Shaw. And Shea Adam is our VP, Racing Field Pit and Paddock reporter. All quiet in the pit and paddock at the moment. Shea, uh, what, any little bits and pieces of chat or gossip that's going around from your... And we should, by the way, whilst we're saying thank you to people who help us out, all of the PR representatives uh, and uh, the team representatives have been mega since we've gone back to racing in July. They're not always at the track. It's difficult to talk to people because of the different bubbles and where you're allowed and where not you're not allowed. So uh, they've really helped uh, us out with the, the flow of information. Yeah, and thank you. Um, you know who you are, the ones who keep me in, in the loop a little bit better than others, perhaps I'll say. Uh, yeah, just had three pit stops from GTD in particular. Um, we've had... One, two, three, four cars that have gone from their starting driver to a second driver and now to a third driver in the GTD category. Uh, Richard Highstand is back in the number 11 for Grasser. Townsend Bell is the third driver in the number 12. And indeed, now all three drivers have been in that theme, Vassar Sullivan Lexus. And John Potter is back in the Magnus Racing Lamborghini. He started the car and then Spencer did a middle stint. Misha Goyford has also gotten back into the 57 after Joey Hand did a middle stint for Heinrich Racing in their Acura. But I'm just looking. We've just had Cooper McNeil, Gar Robinson both come in and do their first pit stops, as well as Madison Snow getting out of the cars. That's nine uh, down to nine hours and 49 minutes to go. So they've driven for two hours and 10 minutes, give or take for all three of those drivers. That's a big chunk of driving time for Gar, for Cooper and for Madison. Yeah. Indeed, so yeah, that's always going to be the plan for the GTD cars to get the uh, the lesser, you know, the, the lower rated drivers get their their minimum drive time in uh, during this race. Everybody has to do a, a minimum of uh, three hours. Uh, the, the minimum drive time really isn't a factor in the in the, in the pro classes. It's really just in the uh, two pro am classes, GTD and uh, an LMP2, of course. Uh, but I uh, say a minimum three hours that the uh, lower rated drivers have to do. And you know, they're always going to get that drive time in early in the race and then hand over to their pro or semi-pro drivers in each of those cars for the for the final 
for the final portion of the race. And that, of course, is the bit that we've got to try and keep an eye on, Jeremy, because uh, sometimes we're comparing, as we were on that restart, in fairness, with Ryan Hardwick, we're comparing uh, apples and tennis rackets there. And, and I'm not being um, at, at all disrespectful to Ryan, but that is part of the strategy. When do you put your non-pro driver in and at what time do you have at the end of the race to be able to make that car go as close as possible to its absolute performance potential. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, you know, and, but certainly, you, know, you, you want your fast drivers in at the end, obviously. Uh, and that's why it was interesting that we talked about it maybe a, a little while ago about how, how the strategy of who's in the car at which particular time. And, uh, and you know, it, it, the the winning cars are going to most likely, you know, the, is, the, is the fastest uh, of the lesser experienced or, or rated drivers. Uh, that's going to be you know, a really important factor in this race. Montoya then still out front. Another half an hour of race already uh, completed. Um, near enough. Well, actually, another 20 minutes of racing. It, it is going very, very quickly uh, indeed. 55 Mazda at the moment picking the way through traffic. Jonathan Bomarito got half a minute to make up on the JDC Miller car ahead. As into the pit lane comes the number 10, Konica and Minolta Cadillac. And that is, yeah, that's 21 laps. So that's all right, Chair. I'm happy with that. Okay. Okay, well, if you're, if you're happy with it, I'll be happy with it. Uh, the last time that they came into the pit lane, they did a driver change to Ryan Briscoe, so there will be no driver change this time around, but they will give him a new drinks bottle as well as four shiny new Michelin tires and a windshield tear-off. Oh, my goodness, it's Christmas for Ryan Briscoe. They're spoiling him all at once. Just waiting on the fuel and the left rear tire to be changed. New Michelin gets thrown on. Wow, that was effortless by the mechanic who placed the Michelin carefully on the rim. And now the car comes off the air jacks, just waiting on fuel. This is a pretty good stop. Perfect on the 32nd mark that the car had been stationary. The car begins to roll once again, which means that no time was lost when the fuel probe went in, when the car stopped, and that was a full tank. Uh, to quote Mr. Punch, that's the way to do it. Uh, absolutely brilliant stuff. And those tire and wheel combinations, by the way, um, lifting those and throwing those around uh, as if it was a paper plate share is not, I mean, that's not what they're like. They're, they are very heavy indeed. Even though they are quote unquote lightweight racing wheels, that's a big chunk of alloy and a big chunk of rubber wrap around it. Um. John, we've just found a full course yellow, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely oh. right. It's basically the equivalent of going to the grocery store, spending $200 and then lifting all of the groceries at once with one hand. Uh, debris on track at turn 17 is what I'm hearing on the race control channel. Uh, yes, confirmed. Thank you, Shay. Well, now, who is this going to benefit? We've got the cars at the front of the field, 17, 18, 19 laps in. Uh, Ryan Briscoe's just done his pit stop. Uh, in that car, we saw that he's right up, just on the racing line. Now, is that a piece of advertising or I I'm not sure what's there? Uh, it looks fairly sturdy, Cher. I think that's basically what happened uh, yesterday in the first Lamborghini Super Trofeo race. One of the banners just toward the exit of 17 came loose and it wound up in almost the exact same spot. So that's what my money would be on. Okay. Uh, Jeremy, everybody's going to pit here, aren't they? Uh, yeah, except for the... Uh, yeah, the, I don't know whether... It's going to be interesting with number 31 and 55 car pits. I think they probably will, because they'll only need a splash of fuel, and uh, whereas everybody else will need a bit more. So they should be able to leap up from their way to the front, except, of course, number 10. They just made their stop. Perfect timing for them. Absolutely perfect timing for them. So that car... Uh, I think it came out just ahead of the uh, number 31 car, but... Uh, he will now go just ahead. I don't know if he was able to stay ahead, but in any case, he will not need to stop now. So we'll stay out and we'll assume the lead of this race. But luckily, in GTD, no real change there. Everybody there had made their their, their schedule. It's sort of just 
within the last uh, five laps or so. So no need uh, to change anything there. Don't think we'll see any of those cars into the pits. And uh, pretty much the same in GTLM as well. No, the only car that's kind of a little bit off sequence with everybody else, I think, was the number 912 car. So, Shea, get ready to get very, very busy indeed. Intervention 2 is coming out of turn 17 now to pick up that piece of debris. Uh, we had been running, and, and nobody can blame me this time, because I never said a word. We've been running for a, an hour and seven minutes under green flag conditions. So, nobody can blame me this time. It's unusual, I know. But uh, time again, if you need to top up the cup of coffee or the cup of tea at, uh, what, half midday, just half past noon in central Florida, which puts it at half past five in the UK. Shit, I think you were spot on there. That looks like a piece <laughs> of uh, a vinyl that's been picked up by the AMR Rapid Response team. Oh, you could put it in the boot. There's room in the back of those Cayennes as our <laughs> AMR safety official folded it up nicely and then gave it to the guy sitting in the back seat. And here, you hold on to this for a little while. Uh, but it is true, they do have a lot of medical equipment and whatnot in the trunk of those uh, Porsche Cayenne, so it might already have been full. Okay, I'll give it to them. <laughs> oh, pits are open for prototype. Yay! Stand Let's see by. comes to visit. Take a deep breath, Shay. You're going to be very busy in a moment or two. They're halfway down the Alec Ullman straight away. Just a quick reminder, you're listening to IMSA Radio RS2 uh, around the world at the uh, radio player and, of course, on IMSA.com around the circuit in central Florida. We're on 99.1 FM. That's WWOJ. Thanks for loaning us your airwaves, guys, once again. Sirius 202 XM217. And if you're outside the US, in sound and vision at IMSA.TV and on radio Show.co. Dot UK. Stand by for action, Ms. Adam. Here comes Juan Montoya, Oli Pla, Tristan Fortier, and everyone else. Oh, joy. This is fun. All right, Montoya is going to be the first one into his box since his box is closest toward the pit in. Fuel and tires for Juan, I would imagine, given how long he's been out there. Yes, and no driver changes. The right side door is open. If they were doing a driver's side a driver change, it would be the left side door open. So fuel and tires for the race leader, also into the pit lane. Both of the Mazdas, Jonathan Bomarito and Oli Pla. Bomarito, I would expect to stay aboard. Pla might get out and might put Nunez in. It is Lena Gage who engineers that car and never second guess the gate. Uh, Scott Andrews is in in the 85, and Gabi Chavez is in in the 31. Driver change for that 31 Whalen Engineering Cadillac as Felipe Nasser is running around the left side of the car and slots himself into that position very effortlessly indeed. Uh, who else came in? Oh, Tristan Vaudier is in the pits too for the number five for Mustang Sampling Cadillac. And two of the LMP2 cars came in. Matt Bell, British Matt Bell, in the 51 and David Hennemeyer Hansen in the eight. Uh, let's see what driver changes did we have. Nunez is in the 77 now. Uh, Harry Tinkle is into the 55, so driver changes for both Mazdas. And it looks like everybody else, except for Nasser, stayed the same. I would have expected the 55 car to be stationary for a lot longer because they'd only been out for 10 laps or so. Uh, see above comment for Gabby Chavez in the 31 uh, as well, or Felipe Nasser, who's taking that uh, car out. So I'll give you a rundown uh, once we... Uh, as we're about to come back to green, uh, uh, as to who got out of the pits first. Um, staying out, Jeremy, of the prototypes, Simon Trummer for PR1 Matheson Motorsport, the number 52 car. He, they'd only stopped, what, six or seven laps ago, so yeah. they, they're going to roll the dice. And that's, I mean, that's reasonable. That's barely, not even a third of the way through their fuel burn there, are they? No, I mean, there's three cars back on the lead lap in, in LMP2 car, 52, 51, and number eight. Uh, and if, if they'd done another three or four or five or ten laps, certainly they would have been in, in the pits because they're going to need less fuel than the, the, the other two contenders there. I would have thought it might have been worth coming in in any case and topping off. They're going it, to, because it'll be a shorter stop, they should be able to leave ahead of number 51 and number eight car and then be able to run the same length of stint uh, through you know after, when we go back to green, but um, you know let's say they've only run 
one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four laps uh, under under green flag conditions. So you know that's only you know, much much less than a quarter of a stint. So uh, it, they, they've elected to to say that stay out there. Don't expect to see probably any GT cars mm. in the pits unless there's any str strategic driver changes. Certainly interesting to me that uh, Brian Sellers has been out in that number 48 car lately. Uh, he's one of the, the few the most highly rated drivers in the uh, in the GTD field to have had any time in the car so far. And that's because uh, the strategy earlier on kind of backfired. So they wanted to make their way through the field a little bit and try and get themselves into position with only an hour and a half to go before the um, points are awarded for the Michelin Endurance Cup. Of course, that number 48 Paul Miller Racing team uh, only do it, concentrating on the Endurance Series this year as a result of the change of plans caused by the pandemic uh, so there's their focus they come in here with a pretty commanding lead and really they, they, you know, they don't need to they don't need to to win the class at the four hour mark if they can be in the top three that would be job done for the number 48 team well, we are going to get some takers from GTD. Highest uh, is the GRT Grassa Racing Lamborghini. Shea Adam. <laughs> Everyone from GTLM has come into the pit lane, and I'll talk about them in a second. But, yes, the Grassa Lamborghini comes in. That's the number 11. That should be fuel and tires only. Fuel and tires only as well for the 48th Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini and the 74 Riley Technology Mercedes. All right, the 911 Porsche is in, and they are doing fuel and tires for Earl Bamber, staying aboard for yet another stint. Now, the 912 is having some issues out on track. They're going to do fuel and tires and then change the ECU inside the driver's compartment, uh, the passenger's compartment of the car. They're hoping that that will cure their ails, but that car hasn't been performing as they had hoped through this stint. So they are going to lose all of their positions on everyone else who did come in at the same time, which is unfortunately everyone else in class for the GCLM category. But Vantor will be staying aboard there. Yeah, but doing that now, Shea, yes, the lose real estate, but they certainly won't drop a lap. Uh, and what they hope to do is get that flat 6.4.2 litre engine, or 0.193, I think it is. Um, and it can't go any bigger. I've seen how close they are together, and they've got the mm, hello. Uh, they've got uh, a number of things plugged into that car at the moment. Earl Bamba sits impassively, waiting for the shout to get going. Safety car is between eight and nine at the moment, and we're getting the final wave by. So they will be going green shortly, but they've still got time, Jeremy, to get that nine one two racing that was uh, Larry uh, sorry aboard the 912 not uh, Earl Bamba my apologies yeah uh, and uh, yeah I'm a little bit surprised they all came in but I'm sure it, once one came in they might as well all come in and so yeah they, they, most of them had only run half a dozen laps under this uh, uh, under green flag conditions before we went back to yellow but you know get get some fresh tires on and again you know look toward the uh, four hour mark and try and get some points for the Michelin Endurance Cup as well because we're uh, yeah, with we're within easily within the window now of, of making that on. We just one stop. Well, that's a problem for the number 11 car that was leading the category oh. in GTD. Uh, and that car has pulled over to extreme drivers right at the end of pit lane. Now, did they get it out of pit lane? It was somewhat recalcitrant starting, needed a bit of help, then a big burnout. Uh, for the Grasser Lamborghini. This is the 11 car we're talking about down the pit lane. That's all good, but it's ground to a halt at the end of the pit lane. The pit lane limit is still on on that car. You can tell that because the marker lights on the front pulled out of the way, Shea. Anything from the team at this point, or are they scratching their heads as much as we are? Uh, nothing from the team as of right now, but unfortunately for Richard Highstein, given the COVID protocols, that which used to be an exit back to the garage staging area is now completely fenced off. So the grasser mechanics are actually having to run all the way down. They are the first pit box towards pit in. Oh. They have to run down to the extreme end of pit out, then push the car back beneath the bridge at the exit of the pit lane to then be able to make the hard right-hand turn to go back to their garage. 
thankfully their garage area is about halfway down the weather tech paddock so it will be a shorter push to get the car back there but they are going to be flat out exhausted by the time they even get to the mobile one bridge let alone by the time they get back to the garage mc using the full course yellow to do a bit of uh sweeping and blowing of the debris the tire debris off the track i don't think that richard highstan jeremy even got through the Michelin pit lane exit with the RFID readers that's there. I think he's pulled to the right of that, as Shea says, to try and get back in to the paddock. Now, whether he was meant to go back in the paddock, whether they told him to do that, but you can't get there from that area now. That's been fenced off, and this is going to cost them dearly. It is. That's uh, really unfortunate for that number 11 team. They've done a... Yeah, they were running out front there, pretty convinced, well, very convincingly, uh, with both uh, Steen Schotthorst and with uh, Richard Highstand. So now they're going to, yeah, I think they've uh, have they already gone one lap down. Yes, I think they have. So that's uh, really, really unfortunate for that uh, for that team. Uh, I'm guessing, Cher, that in July, and indeed the other times that Richard has raced here, you would have been able to get into the paddock area at that part of pit lane. Well, the last time he raced here was last March, and that was an open access area to yeah. the garage area from the pit lane, so you're spot on. That tells me a little bit that he maybe didn't do the track walk this year because it's very evident when you get to that part of the pit lane, you see all the fencing, you see that everything is blocked off, and even throughout the garage area, John, there are several places where you used to be able to come and go, but with the COVID protocol, not anymore. I think this is going to extend the safety car being out, if I'm honest, because that is on the exit of pit lane and there will be people having to move that. In the meantime, uh, the Acura number seven has been in and out. Also, that's Elio Castro Neves. John Ferrano in the number eight tower LMP2 car has been in and out. And John Potter in the 44 GTD Lamborghini, the Magnus GRT car, has been in and out. And now they have managed to get that car uh, pushed through the gap in the wall. So have they opened that up specially, or did he just could he just not get enough lock on then in that case? And I wonder if he's done some damage here when he was doing the burnout and maybe sheared a half shaft in the car has just ground to a halt because he did he was very close to being get that car out the pit leg he was very close but that was a closed off fence area so i'm wondering if they had to move spectators out of the way and then open the fence to be able to let him go back through that area because all weekend they've been directing all of the traffic for the WeatherTech championship through that first opening in the pit lane the second one has been completely blocked off she adam our vp Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock report. A little pause there from me now that that has been cleared with nine hours and 24 minutes to go. We're about to head back for our third green flag of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring 2020. Um, and we are back to racing at just before 12, or just after 12.45 here in Central Florida. And Ryan Briscoe. That, all of that excitement, I forgot to give you the rundown, but it was the number 10 uh, Cadillac from the number 6 on the restart, then the 85 Cadillac, then the uh, Tristan Fortier 5 from Mustang Sampling, then the 77 and 55 Mazdas, and the 31 Philippe Naza in 7th position. That was how they restarted all line astern, of course, at the front of the field in LMP2. It was uh, PR 152 from 51 into Europol. Kubis Bogowski behind the wheel of that car now. Then John Ferrano in the end tower motorsports car. Then the 38 of Don Yount. And it was Corvette ahead in GTLM when they restarted. I'll get to what's happening already. Ahead of the 911 Earl Bamba staying in that car. Yes, 911 Earl drafted into that Porsche. 24 BMW, 25 BMW. Ollie Gavin in the four Corvette. And Lawrence Vanto in the 912. T Bell for Ian Vassar Sullivan. The two Lexus first and second, 12 and 14. From Darren Turner in the heart of racing, Aston Martin 23. From McMurray, this is GTD, of course. Matt McMurray at the MSR Acura number 86. Westfall in the 63 Scuderia, Scuderia Corsa. And Rob Ferriol in the hard point Audi still right up there. That's how 
they're restarted. And behind the wall then, the GRT, Grasa Lamborghini number 11 with a problem leaving its pit box. Ryan Briscoe has pulled out a handy second or so at the front of the field. And the two Mazdas getting rather too close for comfort. Jeremy going down to the hairpin last time around with the uh, uh, with tyres on the grass from the 77 Tristan Nunes car sitting in behind the dark red number 55. Uh, I think they might be on the phone to those and saying, come on, guys, let's be a little more sensible. Uh, yeah, that was a bit hairy, wasn't it? Because uh, Felipe Nazar had a grandstand view of that. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, they, they have changed places. Number 55 car, Harry, the head just also changed up the five car. Mr. Voce has just gone ahead of Scott Andrews at that restart as well. That's for third position. Number five ahead of number 85. Then the two bats. It's got to shuffle around during that round of pit stops. Number 10 car called 40 for the lead because that had stopped just before. But whilst the particular car number 77, Slip back uh, three or four positions during that round of the stop. Down towards the hairpin, that's where the action area is on these opening laps after the intervention of a safety car. That's where you can get down the inside and outbreak some of the other categories, and that's exactly what's happening now with the GT Le Mans runners coming through the front of the GTD field uh, and at the moment the leading Corvette in GTLM is going past Darren Turner for Heart of Racing team Darren staying out of the way and letting the Corvette, the BMW and the Corvette and now a Porsche as well right there as well as uh, one of the prototypes I think that's the 7 car that's coming back through uh, there as well, good heavens Three classes in one place and Darren Turner having to really keep his wits about them there as all of those different categories have found themselves again on the track it's been a very good restart for Ryan Briscoe Jeremy he's pulled out a couple of seconds on Ryan Briscoe and a moment or two ago on the back straight Corvette and uh, Porsche as Earl Bamber had been leading and pushed the number three Corvette all the way to the right-hand side, and then dive back down the inside, going into turn 17 at sunset. And then they got it back again. So Bamba still listed as the leader ahead of Farfus now and Jordan Taylor, but that's just changed again because the three Corvette has got ahead of Farfus in the red BMW as they go up towards turn three what I can't see is where the Porsche is is he ahead of all those yes he is he's just coming out of Big Ben and heading down towards turn seven so a big mix-up going on there and uh, it's like Vantos right in there in the 912 as well with the red stripes down the flank so restart you can see you can see Jeremy why people see yellows breed yellows cautions breed cautions because there's so much fighting going on in the opening laps, opportunities to make up track position when you're so close together. It's like restarting a race, effectively. Yeah, and the, you know, the loser out of all that was the, was the Corvette of, of Jordan Taylor. They got to, he kind of outbraked himself, I think, didn't he, at turn 17. Uh, lost the place uh, to the number 911 car that he just kind of gained as it was side by side on the straights, just squeezing each other there. Uh, so he, he's uh, all of a sudden now down into the third position. And he's going to have the Colton, Colton Herter, I think, for company uh, pretty soon as well. So, uh, yeah, Jordan Taylor, uh, uh, uncharacteristic, I would say, uh, you know, slight mistake there. Had been pushed all the way to driver's right down the Ullman Street. I wonder if there was a bit of dust or debris on the Michelins there that might have contributed to him just not being able to get the car turned in. You've got to have absolutely everything uh, right on point there. Uh, hello to everybody on the mid, in, on the Radio Show Limited Listers Collective on Facebook. Already racking up the comments uh, on there. Neil Charles with Tom Ferg, Logan Malam, and all. I am keeping an eye on that where I can on the 90 million screens that I've got in front of me. I'm only slightly... Oh, and a big off, and it's both 
of this is turn 17 as there's there must be something on the circuit this one two three four cars high point audi both of the lexus the right porsche also coming into the pits there ollie gavin died in, uh, dived into the pits this has all happened at turn 17 multiple cars involved now did they come together we mentioned that they were all battling through their steam coming off the brakes of ollie gavin's corvette and the I was going to say the bonnet, of course, but that is just the inspection panel now on the mid-engine C8R. And at least one of the uh, Ian Vassar Sullivan Lexus has severe damage. I think it's missing a, yeah. a wheel on the left rear of that car from the brief glimpse I got to it. Uh, and it's the 14 car that hasn't moved. T-Bell has got that car, the, the 12 car, into the pit lane. Disaster for Ian Vassar Sullivan, who were leading the class, Jeremy. Indeed so. They're running first and second at the restart with the Aston Martin in third place. Now Darren Turner will lead. Was there a problem? Was there some oil dropped potentially by, by the number three car? I don't know. But it's certainly very surprising that both of Lexus should go off at the same place and it was in number 16 car 16 car was the spun there of course that was at, that was at the whole back of the pack as well in GTD uh, when they came across that incident at Sunset Bend it's been a big big impact for the 14 M Vassar Sullivan Lexus it's moved the big bills of tires the safety team and the medical team already there they're pointing to the left rear of the car i'm not sure that has a wheel on the left rear uh, of that car it was oh it it, the, it was a touch on the inside no there's got to be something down there i thought it was a touch on the inside wall by the leading uh, t-bell car and then his teammate went off in sympathy there's some kind of fluid uh, t-bell gets to the inside and then bounces the car around didn't hit the inside wall. I think the 14 is just trying to avoid it and pinches it and turns round. I, I, I'm not sure it was anything more than that, Jeremy. Uh, whatever it was, it was bizarre. Yeah. Really strange because um, you know, Kirkwood was in second place there behind Towns. The belly was, you know, what, eight, ten car lengths, a respectful distance behind him, and you know, seemed to be through. And I'm sure he would have had to change his line through that corner as a result of uh, Towns Bell spinning. Uh, so that maybe just caught him off guard and yeah, around that car went as well. But golly, what, how, it, how quickly things can change for that Aim Vassar Sullivan team. They've had no luck at all in the last couple of races. And the 12 car share, Adam, is not in the pit lane. No, I heard it driving back to the garage just a few moments ago. There was a loud rumble, but that four Corvette was definitely the impetus of all You're of right. this contact because it was already slowing and Correct. heading back to the garage area. The crew is working on the car. They're and trying to oil. diagnose what the problem is. It's and oil. Let me know, I'll let you know. It's oil coming or fluid coming out of the back of the number four car and uh, quite a significant amount as well. The mid-engined Corvette spewing uh, some of its essential liquids uh, out from underneath the back of that car and that was what started it so t-bell turned in uh, on and it doesn't matter whether it's oil or water or a mixture of both uh, you were coming back to speed after being behind the safety car they're working hard at it so jeremy our first thought and your first observation absolutely spot on i thought with so many cars spinning that there has to had to be something on the circuit but uh, uh, then it looked like it was uh, an unforced error for T-Bell. I take that back immediately, Townsend. He clearly lost grip on the rear end of that car. And at that point, with the bump as well on the turning point, uh, turn 17, that car, uh, T-Bell, was uh, an absolute passenger. And so what happened? I, I, I think even Ollie was sliding on his own fluids yes. there, Jeremy. It was getting worse as he went down the back straight and it's spraying over the camera of the 912 as they were behind. Oh, it's significant, significant. I, I think it's coolant rather than oil because of the light and nature and it's, it's, a, it's a spray. But if that's getting onto the roof camera of the 912, you can only imagine how much is going out underneath the car. And of course, the diffuser there is throwing it up into the air and onto the track. It's leaking onto the track as well. That car is still in the pit lane. 
could even be something like um, brake fluid or clutch fluid or something like that. They're working actually in that sort of area, Jeremy, at the front of the cars. If they're looking at a, a reservoir or something at the sharp end, I, my eyes aren't good enough to read what that piece of tape says uh, underneath there. Shea Adam is watching intently as the uh, Pratt & Miller Corvette racing guys are going to work. But I think the 14 is out of the race. Uh, it's and certainly the tw the number 12 car has uh, severe radiator damage from its contact with the tyres, but that was as a result, not as a cause of what was happening. Shea? Yeah, that's uh, definitely what's going on there, and they will need to worry about the engine as well because Townsend drove it back to the pit lane and then drove it back to the garage too. And if there was no water getting into the engine, then that's not going to be a, a good thing for that Lexus engine either. But a round of applause to Townsend jumps out of the car after he brought it back to the garage and then helps the mechanics push the car back into the garage, get the engine cover off. He's one of the ones who's trying to desperately make this car go again. That's not an effort that you always see from drivers who have just been involved in a wreck. Sometimes they throw their gloves and walk away. No, Townsend is right there trying to help. Well, more drama here at Sebring. And the Ian Bassett Sullivan cars, remember, were first and second in class. Just whilst that was going on, we're compensating the um, DPI class split uh, again. And uh, the during all of that, the 911 car in the little amount of green we had running, Earl Bamba, was warned for blocking. So that is something really uh, to keep an eye on because uh, that will be looked at uh, very carefully and that will be uh, I, I presume that will be car rather than driver uh, driver I believe okay thank you Shea Shea Adam uh, with that well Jeremy just when we thought we were going to get back into the rhythm of, of things still over nine hours to go big drama there uh, which looked to have been uh, the chain reaction set in motion by Oli Gavin's number four Corvette. And to not sure. Excuse me, John. Yes, uh, unlike either Townsend Bell or even Carl Kirkwood, who's of course not very experienced in these cars, uh, but is uh, a very experienced driver overall. Uh, unlike them, either, you know, either those two to make a mistake, and you know the, the cars they were just far enough ahead of the, of the other guys right behind that they, they were able to slow down a little bit, or, or perhaps see the oil, or you know, had a little bit of warning, uh, because uh, you know, I think everybody else was a bit lucky that the two Lexus were probably you know, 15, 20 car lengths ahead of everybody else, so that gave them just a little. Little bit of, of advance warning number 16 car by the way uh, ryan hardwick was driving that car he did spin kind of in avoidance as everybody else checked up in front of him uh, he's fine the car's okay no dramas there but uh, that's a heartbreaker for Aim vassar sullivan i mean how quickly things can go wrong in this uh, sometimes very cruel sport uh, just hearing uh that there may have been contact between the number four Corvette and one of the BMWs on the restart, uh, which is where it may have sustained the damage uh, on the restart. I can't confirm that at the moment. I'm, I'm trying, I'm speaking to our colleagues at uh, Charlotte to see if we can uh, get some definitive angles on that uh, and their replay skills are very impressive so i've just passed uh, that along uh, and thank you to those who are tweeting in uh, hello to gert van camp who's in the car but listening and he said i'm listening in the car for the whole trip and the two minutes i need to get out the car and into the office three cars are out of the race things change fast Thank you very much. You don't say where you are in the world, but thank you very much for tuning in here to IMSA Radio. Uh, still the work going on in the pit lane. Um, well, actually, Shea Adam, nobody working on the forecar at the moment, although Oli Gavin is still installed. Yeah, I can't actually see any mechanics touching the car. Uh, the mechanic at the front is holding the nose cone up, and there is a mechanic with a fire extinguisher bottle, but everyone else is on the wall or on the other side of the wall just looking on, trying to figure out what they can do to fix this car. Uh, Sebastian Roetz uh, confirming 
said the four hit the the four Corvette hit the 25 BMW, but it was such a light tap. I said I'm, I'd be surprised if that is what caused the leak. Clean up continues down at turn 17, and what they'll be really wanting Jeremy to find out is uh, is how far that fluid whatever it is goes back down the track because uh, you just can't have that kind of uh, that kind of inconsistency in the grip you expect if you do the right things break and turn in at the right place you'll get the same result uh, and you, you you can't have that inconsistency and uncertainty for these drivers you can't, and uh, I mean, your yeah, turn 17 is a pretty tricky corner going in there. In any case, it's uh, it's not not as bumpy going in as it is coming out, but it's still you. Yeah, you're right on the edge through there. It's you know very easy. If something isn't quite to, as normal, it's very easy to 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 do exactly what uh, Townsend Bell did there. So just really, really unfortunate for that team. They've just got themselves in position uh, to be uh, up at the front there, and now uh, you know, and now it's all gone wrong. Jeremy Shaw and John Hindhoff in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. You're missing no action uh, on the circuit at the moment. We are in our third full course yellow. And uh, we've already had 11 and a half minutes for a multi-car accident. Fluid out of underneath from the number four car. We think after contact with the number 25 BMW on the lap uh, on the lap after the restart uh, and that's getting worse down the Alec Ull Ullman straight spraying whatever fluid it was all over the 912 that was sitting in behind it the first cars to come on it were the leaders in GT Daytona both of the Ian Vassar Sullivan uh, Lexus RCF GT3s Townsend Bell the leader spinning and didn't get too far around the corner, made contact with the left hand, well, the front of the car to driver's left and the tyre restraining barriers. That's punctured a radiator there. He's managed to get that back to the paddock. Even worse for the car following, the number 14 car, Carl Kirkwood, spinning completely around and going in at a much greater speed. That car has been trailered away. The 16 Wright Motorsport Porsche also having a rotation, but no contact made with that or anybody following. And that car has continued, albeit having uh, dropped down the standings in GT Daytona. Uh, Ryan Hardwick, doing a good job to stay out of the wall, has dropped down to ninth position. Uh, and the Corvette, by the way, that started all of that off the number four car is still in the pit lane with Ollie Gavin aboard. Can't see us going green for a moment or two, Jeremy. There's still a bit of clean-up to do. Gives me an opportunity to do the traditional shout-out for all of our flag marshals, corner workers, recovery and intervention crews, as well as track services, and, of course, our medical crews, both in the EMR intervention vehicles and in the medical centre here at Sebring International Raceway. Add to that anybody who has come out to help, whether it's punching tickets, parking cars or selling programmes, thank you very much indeed for giving the most precious gift you can, the gift of your time, so that we can go racing, all of our volunteers and officials. Coming down to uh, nine hours remaining, we'll be going green shortly, I think, or oh, maybe not. Uh, let's do the uh, rundown for you uh, before we go back to green as we're behind our third safety car here at the 60th annual Mobile One Twelves out as a Sebring. Ryan Briscoe leads for Cadillac and for Konica Minolta in the number 10 car from Juan Montoya in second, the number six Acura Team Penske. Their team car, the number seven, with an intercooler problem earlier on, which has dropped that car some uh, 11 laps back from the lead, at least when that happened. Tristan Fortier is aboard the third place, number five, Mustang sampling Cadillac. 
Then it's JDC Miller Motorsport in the 85. Mazda, the 55. That's Harry Tinkle, Tinknell. Uh, Mazda also in sixth, the 77. They're all line astern behind the safety car, of course. Felipe Naza in the wheel and engineering Cadillac in seventh position. LMP2 led by PR1 Matheson Motorsport. Uh, they didn't take the opportunity to pit in this safety car, did they? No, they didn't. They stayed out. And so uh, they have now done 16 laps, but the uh, bulk of that behind this safety car. Ahead of Kubis Murkowski uh, in Inter Europol's number 51, Oric, uh, John Ferrano for Tower by Starworks, the number eight, and the 38, Don Young. That's your top four in uh, LMP2. Earl Bamba leads uh, in the 911 Porsche from Augusto Farpas and uh, Earl has had a warning for penalty uh, for potential penalty for blocking should I say a warning for blocking Augusto Farpas in the 24 BMW in second Jordan Taylor the three Corvette in third 25 Colton Herder in fourth for BMW and Lawrence Van Ter in fifth the number four car still in the pit lane from GT Daytona and Corvette Racing. Darren Turner leads GTD now after that shamozzle ahead of him uh, from Jeff Westfall. So 23 Heart of Racing, Aston from Jeff Westfall, Scuderia Corsa, the Ferrari number 63 from WeatherTech Racing. Then the 74 Lawson, Ashenbach, Riley Motorsports, Mercedes AMG, GT3, the wins car. Then Matt McMurray for Mayshank Racing, the 86 Purple and Black Acura. Then the 48 Black and Blue, um, Paul Miller Racing, Lamborghini, Huracan, the 48. Then the Turner, BMW, the 96 in sixth. Misha Goitberg for Heinricher uh, and the Acura number 57. Then John Potter for the 44, and he has splashed as well during this in the GRT Magnus Lamborghini. Ryan Hardwick in the teal blue, number 16, Wright Motorsports Porsche, almost getting caught up in that, but not. And Rob Furriol in 10th in the team hardpoint at Audi. The Grasser car, by the way, uh, which I think did a half shaft, drive shaft early on when it uh, burned out coming out of the pits, is still being worked on in the pit lane. No, it's not. It's come out. It's back on the. It's back in the race. She will get me the rundown on that and find out if uh, we were right, wrong or indifferent, but it looked like it cheered something as it did the big burnout going out of the pit lane. Castro never still running. Uh, now 10 laps off the lead, so they have made one lap back and has got the fastest DPI lap of the race, by the way, that car. 147.970. That's how it stands with spot on. Nine minutes to go at the 68th annual Mobile One. 12 hours of Sebring and the next hour of racing gets underway next. Well, just time for us to take a bit of a break. Jeremy Shaw with me in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre, Sirius 202, XM217, WWOJ 99.1 FM, uh, around the circuit in Central Florida. Uh, Ollie Gavin moving again, Jeremy. And I do see the evidence of a little bit of damage to the right front where... The grills are on that car, and I have to say I'm not terribly au fait with the architecture of the new C8R. Oh, I haven't had a real chance to get all over it. There are some lights down there. I don't know what are behind that, and whether a slight touch on the BMW on the lap after the restart might have fractured a radiator, but that seems to have been the car that's caused all the problems, and yet it's back out again now, so it must have been a relatively easy fix. five laps down now that car yeah it seemed to be pretty healthy as it left the pit lane yeah so great we shall see i think we're coming back to green actually good work again by all of our track services so just under eight hours and 59 minutes to go let's call it nine hours three wide on the start line as the two masters are at it again oh my goodness me the guys from Multimatic and Mazda will have hearts in mouths under the sunshine at the moment. 29 degrees Celsius in the air and on the track. 
Sebring International Raceway just coming on to a quarter past one on a Saturday afternoon and we're back racing again and Ryan Briscoe gets a decent jump from Montoya, Vautier, Andrews, Tinkle, Nunes and Naza there, your top seven in DPI still weaving around trying to get some heat in the tyres. And it looked to me as though Harry Tinknell has won the Battle of the Masters for the moment. Yes, he has. And Ryan Hardwickshire, Adam, has come in to the pit lane at that restart. Yeah. Now, I need to check the rule book again really quickly, but I believe you cannot pit off the back of a short yellow that you have to go through one full time. You can't follow the safety car in. So I'm going to look that up really quickly while they do their pit stop. Uh, yeah, I um, um, should probably um, explain a short yellow there that that was not a short yellow it was nearly 20 minutes but it was only six minutes since the previous safety car intervention jeremy and and, and that basically it changes the protocols of what does and doesn't happen behind the safety car and i thought during a um a short yellow you you close the pits the pits don't actually open during a short yellow do they that's correct. Yeah, we didn't see. I don't think we saw anybody into the pits a uh, while that I'm yellow was out because of that. Only the exactly damaged right. car. So the Corvette uh, came yeah, in well, probably just before that was called. Actually, indeed, if I indeed, check indeed. that, yeah, it did it did. That's right. Uh, yes, he did. Shit. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, sh a short full course yellow is not followed by another short full course yellow. But for a four short full course yellow. After the pass around, the pit lane remains closed until the last car has passed the pit entry and the restart has been announced by race control coming to the green flag. Right, got you. So it looks like uh, Ryan might have entered a closed pit. We got the green flag at 18.12.39 and at 18.12, uh, at, sorry, at 13.12.30, uh, can't read me screen here 13 12 53 ryan hardwick came into the pits so he can't have crossed the start finish line um, before he went into the pit lane front of the field earl bamba has been warned for blocking don't forget uh, on the augusto farfus bmw in second position so got to keep his nose clean now not normally in the 9 11 earl but with such a busy weekend, Jeremy, um, drivers, uh, and particularly works drivers from manufacturers, are actually at a premium this weekend. Yeah, very much so. Uh, 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 we, whenever we, we talk about number 911, about Earl Bam, but I think number 912. Yeah, absolutely. Now, so I've really got, got gonna have, I'm going to have difficulty wrapping my head around that uh, through the rest of this race. But yeah, you know, I mean, Neil Jarney doesn't have any experience in these cars, racing experience in these cars before, and he's about the only. Porsche factory driver wasn't otherwise in point this weekend, so that's why he's here. And that, that's also why Earl Bam was going to be spinning his stop just to keep a bit, a bit of a break for the, uh, the regular 911 drivers, Nick Tandy and Fred Bakovecki. I'm sure he won't get much, he probably won't have much time in a number 911, I wouldn't imagine. Uh, but uh, he, he's there in case they need. Yeah, I, I, and as you say, to allow them a little more flexibility. Uh, no more than four hours and any six uh, in the race. Uh, I, I did hear uh, from uh, from Porsche if they needed anybody else that they were going to shout Mark Webber up to get back in a car. To be honest, I think that's how far down the the list. If they got any further down, um, they would have been on the Porsche owners with the race license, and then I might have well, got a shout. I was going to say, unfortunately, <laughs> you're not you're not in the United States. Uh, no, no, otherwise, if, you might have had a shot at that. No, exactly. <laughs> Exactly right. I could have I, I, I could have had a quick trip down to Ricard without having to get on a plane and uh, and done a bit bit down there. I have some experience of um, of going around Ricard, although that was many years ago in a GT1 Viper. Didn't end well. Well, didn't end as I hoped. Let's uh, let's say. Let's dig out that tape. Uh, I, I'm saying nothing. I'm saying absolutely uh, nothing. The leader is still Ryan Briscoe. And he's coming through to Le Mans Ben, turn 16. He's got a line of cars behind him that stretches all the way down to seventh position, number 31, Philippe Nazar. And that is under six seconds. They're all on the back straight together. Meantime, battles in GT Daytona continue with Lawson Aschenbach and Jeff Westfall 
third and second. And Darren Turner only just ahead of that. And it's side by side between Ashenbach and Westfall as they are heading round the far side of the circuit to turn 13 at the braking areas. And the red, white, and blue WeatherTech Ferrari still just about holding on. And this is allowing Darren Turner to get a bit of a gap, Jeremy, in the heart of racing Aston Martin. Great to see DT back in IMSA, back in the Aston Martin, and fabulous to see heart of racing and that vantage at the front of the field. Yeah, it'd be, uh, no, no complaints for Darren Turner there uh, to see that battle going on behind him. It is great to see him. Uh, what a driver to have to be able to plug in to as a third driver for the long distance races for that half a racing team. I mean, Darren Turner, he's been around, he's done everything in his career. Uh, and you know, he's still got the enthusiasm as if he was uh, starting out. So great to see uh, and he's in the leading race the Ferrari of Russell, well, and all the smash <laughs> Porsche 911 still leading uh, in the GT Le Mans category and just checking to see where we are in terms of uh, pit stops I think pretty much well, Ryan Briscoe has been out there for 17 laps but of course uh, we've had 10 of those so more than half of the time that he spent out there uh, that he has been behind the safety car not the laps but certainly the time Shea, I was questioning whether that was oil or brake fluid or, or I didn't think it was oil because they were looking at the front of the car I thought it might be brake clutch or power steering fluid uh, what was it from the Oli Gavin number four water it's oh. that simple as water coming out from the Ford Corvette. Now, that's not exactly comforting because we're not entirely sure what caused the water to come out, but the crew seems confident that they have rigged up a fix and the number four Corvette should be okay, but they said it was not as a result from any contact. No, I, I, all of the reports that I've had about the contact with the BMW said it was so, so negligible as to be, you know, unbelievable that it would have caused uh, any kind of, of damage um, I, I have a question from Elliot Mason share for you the warning with Earl Bamba which you said was driver related for blocking does that carry over then onto the 911 uh, under the 912 rather when he gets uh, back into his own car I, I should clarify that because the warning for Earl is for the 911. So, yes, it is a car related right, okay. penalty. And if the car incurs another penalty, that will be carried forward. But our race control knows our drivers. And if Earl starts blocking in the 912, they will be less likely to issue a warning and more likely to issue a penalty okay. beforehand. Yeah, and, and he'll have a little less. Uh, leeway. I know everything has to be judged on its merits, but of course there is a cumulative uh, effect uh, on, on, on all of this uh, and everything's got to be set in, in context, which I certainly don't uh, have uh, any kind of issue with. Other offences taken into consideration, etc, etc. Front of the field, Ryan Briscoe leading uh, for Conning Minolta by almost two seconds now. Simon Trummer for PR1 Mathis and Motorsports in the very elegant, I think, silver and blue Orica, just on the back straight now, going by the uh, Ryan Hardwick car. Is it still Ryan in the 16? Yes, it was. He, uh, w what did we reckon he did that extra pit stop for, Shea? Sorry, I, I, you may well have mentioned it, but I was uh, busy doing a, something else when you were talking about it. Um, was that a new set of tires? Is that the stuff that you're thinking about? He was in eight minutes right. ago. Yeah, I think that was fuel and tires. Jeremy? Oops. He came, yeah, it was right at the green. Yes, he came yeah. in behind the safety car at the at the restart. So uh, maybe he flat spotted his Michelin. That's not a bad call, is it, to be honest? Because he was rotating down at turn number 17. And he's back out again now. Uh, and Ryan... Uh, needing to get his time in, of course. Just, uh, so Jeremy, we're, we're getting, we're into the hour before, the 50 minutes before, uh, we start handing out our first Michelin Endurance Cup 
points. 9-11 on 24 is a pass for position. Uh, so Earl Bamba must have lost the lead and has just got it back. Uh, that, Did he? Okay. Didn't yeah. see. Did, didn't notice. Did not notice him losing the lead. Uh, and, uh, no. Did he? Well, he's just past the 24 in going really, into yeah. turn three. Oh, well, he, well, he was ahead of him, I think, when he went past the finish line. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I'd agree it's with that. One or something. Oh, right. Yeah, oh, wow. absolutely. Maybe it was a side-by-side. -side. So, go. well, it's maybe get a chance. It uh, was down into turn one. Down into yeah. turn one. So he had lost the lead for wow. all of about 250 yards. <laughs> wow. Dives back to the inside with the old over and under. Side by side at the breaking area, turn three. Well, that was feisty enough at the well, front of the field. I like that. I mean, we, yeah, we are down to the last couple of laps of this race, of course, aren't we? So, uh, no, we're not. No, <laughs> yes, great point. Good and Shea, you've got an update from Race Control, and thank you for them for coming back on the short yellow regulations for this year. Yes, there has been a change. In previous years, that would have been a penalty for the 16 Wright Motorsport Porsche following in the safety car. But this, as of this year, the pits are open when the lights go out on the safety car for short yellows. So it is the same for short yellows and for full course yellows. Right, OK, understood. Thank you, Cher. And thank you, Race Control. And, and I, when I was mentioning all the volunteers, um, I, I didn't mention Race Control specifically, but I should have. Race control and all of our officials, thank you. But race control, thank you on a number of levels. One, for always being transparent with us and letting us know, uh, if sometimes even before we've asked a question, what is going on. But certainly sending us texts, answering questions, even in the middle of busy races, so that we can pass that on to the fans around the circuits and around the world. And also just for the way you've gone about your officiating this year, the... Uh, the way that you've let incidents develop on the track, giving people a chance to get back on the grey stuff and off the green. Uh, and uh, that is a, a, a fine tradition in IMSA race control, which has been upheld mightily this year. Thank you very much indeed for allowing us to get as much racing as possible. And plenty of racing going on down in GT Daytona, where Lawson Aschenbach and Jeff Westfall are still at it behind Darren Turner, who's pulled out ooh, almost three quarters of a second ahead of these two. Uh, and Jeremy Shaw, you've been doing a bit of investigation uh, on the number 16 coming in at the end of, of that long full course yellow. Yeah, thanks to Kelly Brule, uh, just strategy call. They were at the back of the pack in any case. So just come in uh, fuel and fresh tyres for the number 16 car. Uh, he, he'd had that spin, so uh, you know nothing, nothing ventured, nothing gained really. Off strategy a little bit with everybody else, but still uh, very much in contention with that car. Uh, and I quite like that, if I'm honest. Is the leader from LMP2 comes into the pit lane. She'll keep uh, an eye uh, on that. The um, Wright Motorsports Porsche is uh, what we're talking about at the moment, which has been leading. Uh, Ryan Hardwick now has done a little over two and a quarter hours of what has to be a three-hour uh, drive stint in the car. So he's well under an hour that he requires. Now, any time spent in the pits doesn't count there. So the actual drive time that he needs, Eve, uh, Eve Shea is about... <laughs> Uh, about 55 minutes before he has met his drive time because of the multiple trips down the pit lane for the number 16 during his stint. Right. But I'm keeping track of it. Don't worry. No, I know you are. Very good. Thank you. At IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch, still plenty of time to go in this one. Eight and three quarter hours to go. Um... The one thing that we didn't touch on, Jeremy, with the, both Lexus in trouble, uh, what are the GTD championship implications? Steve Tadman, among others, asking uh, about that. It does have championship implications, of course it does. The which which one on the on the two Lexus, the Lexus. in GT2? Well, yeah, it pretty much pretty much takes them out of contention. I would say. I mean, they're going to be uh, they're already a third in the points here. Uh, out third and fourth, Aaron Tillis and Haw Hawks with third and fourth. They're each separated by two points. They're driving, of course, another uh, 14 car, uh, which is 
the car that uh, has not rejoined after that accident. So, you know, they're, they're not going to get any significant points here. Uh, so they came into the weekend, Arantinitz did uh, eight points behind the number 86 of Mario Farnbacher and Matt McMurray, uh, and one point behind Ryan Hardwick and Patrick Long in number 16 car. So it's still the, uh, the 86 and the number 86 and the uh, number uh, 16 car that they are going to be continuing to battle out for the championships and I'm afraid it's the end of the end of the road for Lexus. The good news is uh, Lexus did win the uh, Sprint Cup drivers, teams and manufacturers championships so at least they got something out of this season and it's been a very good season for that team other than this finale of course. Yeah. So now the long charge back for the number 16, Ryan Hardwick, driven by Wright Motorsports Porsche. He is going to be pretty close to have, uh, completing his three hours by the time he gets to the end of the stint that he's on now. I, I think she may be a tiny bit short, but with the, the multiple yellows, of course, and again, this is no disrespect to Ryan, but it's good strategy from the team. They've had him in that car for a long time, but whilst you're out behind a safety car, you can't make up or lose any time to the cars around you. And you know, even I could jump into a car and not lose any time to Ryan Briscoe, Juan Montoya and Tristan Fortier for the 20 minutes that you're behind a safety car. So that's actually been smart strategy from the guys at right. So let's uh, take a look and see where the action might occur next. The two Masters are still pretty close together. That's uh, fifth and sixth with Felipe Nasser right there. At the front of the field, it should be Ryan Briscoe to come in next. Uh, but there's been so much yellow. It's what, 10 laps of yellow in his uh, over now one hour since he was last along the pit lane. Uh, I, 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 I now have to wait to see what those 10 laps of following the safety cars done to Ryan Briscoe's fuel mileage. Leader through the Jean de Bian bends towards Le Mans. And coming on to the back straight. WEC pits on the right hand side of the leader. That's where the Challenger Series have been this weekend. But the IMSA Weather Tech Sports Car Championship pitting out of the main pits here at Sebring. Around the circuit and Central Florida, WWOG 99.1 FM, Sirius 202 XM 217, and around the world without block or interruption on RS2. IMSA Radio, part of the Radio Show Limited network of audio and visual channels. Good to have your company. IMSA TV, for those of you outside the US, if you're in the US, and you are so equipped. Don't forget Lee Diffie and the team on NBCSN covering this race for you as we go flag to flag here. Front of the field, Ryan Briscoe, Jeremy warming to his task as the uh, VP Racing Fuel burns off in the glossy black number 10, Conningham and Alton Cadillac. Yeah, he likes being in the lead of the race. He's just had his best uh, lap of the race. So 148.908 for that uh, number 10 car. So uh, you're clearly uh, all running uh, according to plan at this stage with what uh, we've got 40 minutes now until the points are awarded for the first time for the Michelin Endurance Cup and uh, all of the GT, or all of the uh, DPI cars are going to be able to make a stop and get to that four-hour mark with just that one pit stop. So it's pretty much even even Stevens now from here until the first tranche of points is, is awarded. Yeah, 40 minutes to go. LMP2 now led by into Europol with Kubas Mikovsky. The number 51 car. Uh, oh, he goes to pit stop shortly, I would say. Again, you know, 10 laps of actually a little bit less uh, than that. Eight laps of uh, yellow in Cuba's uh, 
inched in length than Jeremy, but it can't be too long before the uh, Gibson engine LMP2 comes into the pit lane. And the, the uh, number 52 car was in uh, just uh, a couple of laps uh, ago, uh, three laps ago. That uh, car, of course, did not stop during the, the first of the two full course cautions that came on lap, uh, well, for the for the uh, LMP2 cars on lap 40, on, on lap 69. So I was sort of still a little bit early for that number 52 car to come in, to be perfectly honest. It had done uh, half a dozen laps under uh, Greed before the yellow. They ran that long extended caution period. Uh, and now it was, it was again in again only seven laps after. So I just thought that 52 stop was a little bit early, to be perfectly honest. Ryan Briscoe in the pit lane. Uh, excuse me. Um, Philippe Nazza in the... Uh, pit lane for Whelan and that car 12 green flag laps only uh, in that stint, check that uh, 14 lap green lap flag like green flag laps only share and uh, what service did uh, that car, those couple of cars get? Uh, it was only fuel and tires for Felipe Nazar as they are clearly back time into the four hour mark now with 36 minutes and 50 seconds to go to that point, they need to win each of the segments to try and wrangle that championship away, the Michelin Endurance Cup from the 10 car. Also into the pit lane was the 85 for JDC Miller Motorsports, where Stephen Simpson took over from Scott Andrews. So Scott Andrews climbing out of the DPI. And the first time he actually got out of the car the other day in practice, he forgot to unplug his helmet. He looked a bit like a dog on a leash tied around himself. Into the pit lane comes Ryan Briscoe. He should be there. I'm not exaggerating when I say that. It was uh, quite the sight for uh, most people looking up and down the pit lane. Uh, we've got Ryan Briscoe in. We've got Juan Montoya in. And Simon Pagano is actually taking over the car for that actor team intensity crew. Uh, who else did I see come in? Harry Tinker from the 55 Mazda. They've put the driver change on every stop so far. And yeah, the 77 stayed out. Justin Nunez doing one more lap. Fuel tires and driver seat for the six fuel and tires only for Ryan Briscoe. Yeah, and again, this all uh, uh, being influenced by the long safety car periods that we've had. Dave Alcott, among others, Ian McCarthy, uh, and uh, also one or two others, as we've just had the seventh lead change, Jeremy tells me. Uh, Please pass on sincere thanks for the whole season to Ray Wenzel Jr., Rooftop Ray, and all the camera operators for IMSA this year. Fabulous coverage that we've had wherever we are in the world. Uh, that's a big hit here from me, by the way. Always out in the worst or the best of the weather. Long days as well, like uh, Fast Friday. My goodness, everybody had a long stint yesterday. So another car in the lead, Tristan Nunes, and a new car to the front. That's the first time I think the Mazda 77 has led, Jeremy. Yeah, it, did, did, it actually led one lap, but only under caution uh, okay. when uh, the other cars came in at the, at the previous uh, uh, time. So this is the first time it's led uh, under green flag conditions, and that will be our seventh lead change of the day. We've had five different leaders so far, number seven, number 31, number six, number 77, and number 10. And Tristan should be able to do... Well, no, he's probably going to come in at this lane. In fact, you know, he's in, even as I say it, he's already diving into the pit lane here. Uh, now, is Tristan on the second part of a double? I think he is. Uh -huh. isn't he? Or have they been singling again like the other master? Tristan got in the car with nine hours and 35 minutes to go. We are now at eight hours and 35 minutes to go. So Tristan will be staying aboard for a double. And uh, fuel and tires for the Mazda. Yes, they are doing the tires as well. Uh, back in, I saw in the background the number seven come in, but that car, of course, several laps down as uh, Alexander Rossi climbs aboard. And we are expecting GTD to stop soon. Um, yes, the number 23 Aston Martin, the 63 Ferrari, and the 86 Acura, as well as the 30 Audi. They all should be coming to visit me soon. Share Adam with that VP Racing Fuel pit report. Seven Acura back out. Elio Castro Neves brought the car in. And yeah, 10 laps down a shit, rightly says, for that car. If you weren't with us earlier on, it was an intercooler problem that required 
Uh, quite a lot of remedial work. That car had to go back to uh, back to the awning, and turbocharger had to come off as well on the left-hand side of that Acura engine. New owner operators for the Acura DPIs next year with Wayne Taylor Racing and Mayer Shank Racing both getting a couple of Mazda, of Mazda, Acura chassis, sorry, and uh, but as far as we know, only running a car apiece, at least for the substantive part of the season, having the other as uh, backup and spares. Can't wait to see the cars in their new livery. Share Adam with breaking news on uh, one of the GTD runners from ninth position. Paul Miller Racing has a right rear tire that is going flat. Brian Sellers with the long second sector is bringing the car into the pit lane. He's only been in 16 minutes ago, so this is very much off strategy, but they had pitted at a weird time trying to vault themselves forward to hit that four-hour mark and clinch the Michelin Endurance Cup. This is going to put a dent in those plans, though. Already in the pit lane, uh, it could just be a quick uh, stop, but they are going to lose an awful lot of uh, of real history. By the way, I should have said Elio Castroneves brought the uh, number seven car in. Alexander Rossi, it was, that took the number seven Acura team Penske out, and he is on the circuit for his first taste of the race this year. Ryan Briscoe still leading by 2.9 seconds from Mazda. So 10 black Cadillac from 77 white Mazda, from six white and orange Acura, Simon Pagino, five seconds or so between those. And right up the tailpipes of Pagino is Tristan Fortier in the grey Mustang sampling Cadillac. That number five having a good run here today, Jeremy, being there or thereabouts and showing good pace to hang on to the Acuras, the Mazda, uh, and the uh, number 10 Cadillac ahead of it. Yeah, I completely agree there. They've, uh, they've had a a good strong run all the way through this race they've been running right up amongst the leaders haven't yet led uh, a lap but they've been uh, you know, right there and in contention and will remain so now uh, with Tristan Vautier driving that car at the moment he, they've only had uh, two drivers at the wheel of that car so far Sebastian Bourdais did the first uh, three stints now Tr uh, Tristan Vautier is on his uh, fourth stint uh, but uh, the, the short, what shortened by the by the yellow, so he will change. I'm sure there will be a driver change next time around in that number five car. But uh, it's been a good stint by both of those two Frenchmen in the early stages. Third driver, of course, this weekend is uh, yet another Frenchman. That would be Loic Duval, still to come. Augusto Farfus is the first of the GT Le Mans pitters for BMW in the number 24 ship. He got in the car just about an hour and 15 minutes ago, so he should be staying aboard for another stint, should Augusto. This is one of the cars looking for the Michelin Endurance Cup in the GTLM class, fuel and tires during that stop. And I'll wait to make sure, because I saw another helmet up on the wall, but I think Augusto did stay aboard, and it was just a drinks bottle change. He's also in the pit lane. was Rob Ferriel. It's now Pierre Caffer in the Audi R8 GT3. Hard to point racing, that's pretty fun to say. And it was Augusto who stayed aboard. The BMW. Seems like only yesterday that Pierre Caffer was on the podium here for uh, Audi UK, the Velox team. Uh, Dave Ward, now a progressive motorsport. David Ingram, great friend personally and professionally to us here at uh, Radio Short Limited. Uh, all on the podium here at Sebring. Uh, it wasn't just yesterday, it was quite a long time ago. <laughs> I won't embarrass the ball by seeing when, but I did see a picture that Wardy tweeted earlier on this week. Everybody looked a heck of a sight younger, is all I'm going to say. Heart of Racing, Aston in uh, from what I think was the lead in uh, GT Daytona. Darren Turner brought the car in, shit. Correct, and he is staying in the pit lane. Fuel and tires for the Aston Martin, but I think that was the helmet of Roman DeAngelis climbing by the wheel for his first stint. Eight hours and 59 minutes to go, and they will have now cycled through all three of their drivers. Very clean stop by the hard race. And again, the tires and the driver change done before the fuel hose came out. That's all you can ask 
it should be the fuel that is the time determinant of the car sitting on the pit lane. We've gone through another half an hour, eight and a half hours to go here on IMSA Radio. Live coverage, flag to flag of the 68th Sebring Mobile One 12 hours presented by Advance Auto Parts. And it will be 100 laps completed this time by, by the leaders. So that's another little milestone there. In our mission at Countdown to Green, we mentioned the Porsche keys to the race. The first one was be there when it gets dark. It gets dark earlier and stays dark longer this year, but we're still a little ways away from that. However, we are now, Jeremy, only half an hour away from the first tranche of Michelin Enduro Cup points at the four hour mark. There'll also be eight and of course at the end at 12 and we have seen people having that affect their strategy but the intervention of safety cars has, has rather smooth to all that back out again indeed so and uh, i i think uh, all of the dpi cars should be able to get to that four hour mark without making uh, another pit stop um they came in oh yeah i did i did make a note uh yeah they should they should be fine i think it's fairly close but they should be fine so uh, they're all on the same strategy there. And uh, yeah, it'd be uh, five points for the leader in each of the classes. It goes down by point four degrees, four, three, and two. And all cars in each class gets two points behind the, the top three. Uh, let's go to Sheer Adam down in the pit lane, looking at the Auto Nation Acura. Meyer Shank racing Acura, that's the pink one with the black accents into the pit lane. Matt McMurray staying aboard for yet another stint, as he should. He's only been in the car for about an hour and a half now. Fuel and tires for this car also into the pit lane. The 911 Porsche with Earl Bamber behind the wheel. I would expect him to be jumping out of the car as he's done a double. And yes, indeed, he has. So is it Nick Tandy taking back over or is it Fred McAfee and it is Fred? 911 refires and heads out of the pit lane and so we have have we had a tandy in that uh, in that 911 yet yeah, right behind the uh, number the 89 and number 86 uh, accurate excuse me uh, as they go back out onto the pit lane have we had a tandy in that 911 yet sure Yes, he started it and for 57 did. minutes. Of course he did. Yes. See, I'm starting to, uh, I'm starting to forget what happened at the start of the race. Now that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's great stuff. Um, just checking through. Uh, I'm very happy with all those pit stops. They are all coming on about the the right side. Uh, Jeff Westfall's been out there for a long time. Comes into the pit lane uh, now. Uh, of course, extended that stint by the two safety car periods, one particularly long when we had that fluid coolant on the circuit from Oli Gavin's number four ship. I was not expecting to see Jeff Westfall pulling himself out of the Ferrari, particularly after he had, unfortunately, a short day yesterday. He's very well rested. But that is Alessandro Balzan getting into the 63 speed area. Of course, Ferrari, a seat he knows very well and a position he knows well. They are trying to go for this Michelin Endurance Cup. They need to win all three segments and the race to try and steal it away. And they're putting themselves in a position to do that. But it is a lot of fuel that needs to go into that Ferrari because Jeff had been out on track for more than an hour and 22 minutes. So a very lengthy stop and a very good pit stop by the scoot area, of course, boys and girls. Potential for those, uh, that team, to step up into GT Le Mans next year. They have run a GT Le Mans car at Le, at Le Mans. Uh, and we're in the Pro Class, actually. Went from the AB to the Pro Class uh, in... And he said this June's race, this September's race at Le Mans in this 2020 year that is just been difficult, shall we say, he says diplomatically. Tower Motorsports, John Ferrano just out of the pit lane. And it was uh, it was uh, Alessandro Balzan, by the way, that took over the Scuderia Corsa, number 63. And if they were to come back in for some of the GT Le Mans races next year, that would make things very interesting indeed. 
couple of other juicy little paddock rumours, but they're only that at the moment, and I haven't been able to get any proper uh, handle. But uh, a couple of other teams as well that we might find, uh, and another manufacturer that we might find in there. No Porsches next year at all. Uh, I, I'm having, I, I'm struggling a little bit here, Jeremy. As oh, as, as is the Tower Motorsport car. Uh, that is John Ferrano, who has had a spin. He had a spin earlier on at uh, turn 16, then he went off at turn 17. Uh, this time, the uh, number eight car has gone off the circuit on the exit of turn one, and that is seldom a small incident. But he's got the car pointing in in the right direction. Last race of the season, I still got in my mind, Jeremy, that we should be at Road Atlanta because it's always yeah. been Petty Le Mans. And I keep looking at the track, and I know it's the last race of the season. I keep thinking, hang on, the pits don't look right. That's uh, anyway. Uh, I'll, by the end of the 10 hours, the next eight and a half hours, I'll have I've got that sort of turn of motorsport in the pit lane. Shea, take me out of this. Help me, help me. <laughs> Stop digging. Give me your shovel. Uh, Nick Yellowly is taking over for his first ever race laps at Sebring International Raceway behind the Turner Motorsports BMW. They had their tacos last night and maybe a margarita or two down at Don Jose's. But now it's time for this serious business. Still a in the car for two and a half hours near enough. So that was a very good spin by Dylan. But now it's time for Nick Yellowly to go see what this track is like and what it's like in the daytime, for real this time. I thought it might have been an old taco Sunday. You need to explain that the tacos and margaritas aren't the normal pre-race um, protocol for, for Turner Racing, but, but it is a bit of a tradition for them. They have an affinity. Uh, Will Turner, who is the man who's famous above the door for Turner Motorsports and their entire BMW organization, they really, 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 really like tacos. So when they do well, they're rewarded by a taco dinner. You know how some people take you out for a nice steak dinner? Well, no, no, no. For Turner, it's tacos. And whenever they win a race, they go get Mexican that night. Well, they did it a couple, well, a couple months ago now at this point at VIR. They've done it at Michelin Raceway Road Atlanta. And now they're looking once again to clean up at Taco Delicious. And they were successful yesterday and in the, mission, the final round of the Mission of Pilot Challenge. That's been a great series. Didn't see that. There'll be extended highlights on NBCSN in uh, about a week. And uh, also the full race flag to flag with our IMSA radio commentary on the official IMSA YouTube channel. GT Le Mans pit stops continue. It's another BMW for you, ship. And it's back to uh, Conor Di Filippi for the 25 BMW. So Bruno Spangler with no laps yet in the Sebring 12 hour. Although he has raced here, he raced here back in the race in July and he has raced in the WEC version of the Sebring endurance race, but that one being a thousand kilometers slightly different. So a little bit of trouble trying to get the driver plug into the uh, left-hand side in the driver's headrest. That was the same issue that they had when they were installing Colton into the car about an hour and a half ago. So a persistent issue for the BMW Team RLL with the 85 with a good stop. And by the way, the sister car, the 24, when they came in and did their stop and left Augusto in the car, that was partially to try and jump ahead of the 911 Porsche. They need those Michelin Endurance Cup points. They need a one-point advantage over the 911 at any of the segments, and then they can clinch it. So they did a partial fuel load, but they did give Augusto new tires. Share Adam with that VP Racing Pit and Panic reports. The leaders, notice plural, coming through. Le Mans Bend and onto the Alec Ullman straight now. And Ryan Briscoe has been caught by the Mazda of Tristan Nunez. Less than half a second between those two as Corvette and BMW go side by side. Down into turn seven. That's the, the four car of Ollie Gavin, who is uh, now some five laps away from the lead. After that uh, fluid leak, leaders have just crossed the line and there was half a second between them. Frisco from Nunez, absolutely together. They've got a little bit of traffic ahead of them, including the Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini, and just ahead of them, as they go through Big Ben, turn six and down towards the braking area for turn seven and the hairpin 
is the number 74, Riley. Into and out of it. 77, right with the leader. Up towards turn 10 now. And they've dealt with the 48, Lamborghini. Now, have they managed to get past the 74 AMG? I think they have. Fred McEvec, he's just put the fastest lap of the race in him. GT Le Mans, he's just got back into the 911, a 57 4 7 7. Bruno Spengler, by the way, uh, in the number 25 car, which is just ahead of the much delayed number four Corvette. Whilst the battle for the lead comes back around again to the back straight. Ryan Hardwick back in the pits for the number 16 right motorsport Porsche as well. And how much time has he got in the car? I think he's probably just about done his time there. And Jeremy Shaw, you've noticed a problem for David Enemar Hansen in the number eight car? Uh, yeah, that's just made two pit stops and successive laps. All of a sudden, it's a couple of laps down. The car was uh, shown as having a... Uh, Continuing slowly, I guess it stopped briefly out on the, perhaps out on the racetrack. Is now, uh, I think, going again. He's now out of the pits, but a couple of laps behind the uh, other two cars that are leading in LMP2. Uh, Jacob uh, Schmikowski leaves Scott Huffaker now by only about four four seconds or so. That gap has come down uh, over the last uh, half a dozen laps, just uh, little by little. The youngster Scott Huffaker. Uh, driving the PR1 Matheson Motorsport Century and chasing after you into your car as we see the GTLM leader after the recent pit stops for 911 and 25 number three car on pit lane. I can hear the uh, rattle guns going off their ship for the number three Corvette. Yeah, Nick Katzberg in that car now as his first stint uh, getting ready to go out there. A windshield tear off for Nick and fire up the engine. Just waiting on the fuel. A perfect pit stop by Corvette Racing. Still that great battle going on for the lead. As the other BMW, which Spengler on board now in fifth position, uh, is coming out of turn 17. Leaders are on the back straight, and it looks for a moment as though Ryan Briscoe has held off the attentions of Tristan Nunez. as he's pulled out three quarters of a second. It was, well, it was three tenths not so very long ago. It's now 1.2 seconds as they come down into turn 17. We'll get a glimpse of them as they go past the start finish line. Uh, 57 accurate in the pit lane. Shea, that looked uh, like full service. Was the driver change there as well? There was, I believe that was Trent Hinden's helmet getting into that car too. Uh, it, it is a little confusing. We have two Captain Americas in that car with Joey Hand and Trent Hinden, but I think that was Trent's helmet uh, going into the car this time. Uh, into the pit lane uh, for David Enemar Hansen. So I think that's the third lap in a row, Jeremy. He's been in the pit lane. Yeah, not good for that car. They clearly got some sort of a problem on that uh, Tower Motorsports by Starbucks entry. That's a shame, that car had been running uh, pretty nicely, certainly with, the, with uh, David Heinemann Hansen just doing a super job, but it turned into some really good lap times. But uh, that's, I think, three stops in, uh, in succession for that number eight car, so now falling further behind the, uh, the other three.